Between the expansion that told us the story of a liberator and the expansion to conclude everything, there was a story that was equally as important. A story that took place in a distant star across time and space. A story of the eternal war between light and dark. A story of heroes and villains, of scions and sinners, and the tragic tale of an ancient civilization whose story had been all but forgotten. Yes, today we'll be covering the full story of Shadowbringers as it is told to us from 4.4 through 5.3. Hello, it's me, Baker, aka I'm a Cuddlefish. You might be wondering why there has been no uploads for a long time. Well, quite frankly, I did the exact same thing as Naoki Yoshida did just now when he delayed Endwalker. Basically, I briefly went to do some real life stuff and had noticed, oh shit, I've been upgraded to having 100 subscribers. For me, this was huge, a triple digit number amount of people are actually invested into listening to what I have to say. I couldn't be more humbled by this, so thank you to everyone that have been sticking around, it truly means a lot to me. So I thought I would give something back for giving me this amazing feeling, right? And I thought what better way than to, for the first time ever in this channel, actually analyze MSQ content and an entire expansion and give it a Doro look. However, I got a bit carried away while doing it, because I really wanted to give this expansion the attention I feel it deserves. Thus, it's been taking me so long to get it out and it has been my sole focus for the past month or two. So I do apologize that I have not been uploading and I hope I can make up for it with this video and its two follow-up parts. Those observant among you have no doubt noticed that I tend to mainly focus on talking about either side content, mainly Chronicles of a New Era questlines, or focusing on a specific character or a specific job. The reason I do this is because talking about the MSQ in this much detail would be such a massive task, it would pretty much kill me. And so I find it easier to focus on smaller parts of the story at a time, whether that be a side quest or a singular character. However, because Shadowbringers was such a big motivation for me to start uploading content seriously and put more effort into my videos, and of course, the fact that many of you absolutely loved this story, I felt, sure, why not make an exception here? Additionally, with Endwalker really close to release, this I feel is the ideal time to create this type of a video. Furthermore, this video is meant to be in contrast to a video I have done previously, where I criticized Shadowbringers as far as its gameplay aspects went, whereas this video was talking about the things I found less desirable about the expansion, this one is going to be more just talking about the positive aspects of this expansion, which there are a lot of. Well, to be more specific, I will be talking about the story, but I will be mentioning some negatives, of course. But you get the idea. Now, what do we consider positive about Shadowbringers? Its story, characters, music, the quality of life additions, Iskard restoration, save the queen, the boss fights. There's probably a lot of things that anyone watching this considers great about this expansion. So let's discuss some of those things today. And when I say discuss, I really mean it. Ever since I started making videos, I have always been trying to improve on being more concise to the point, so that even though I like to talk about things in more detail, you wouldn't be watching me just rambling nonsense for 50% of it. To give you an anecdote, I was particularly worried about releasing my video on Cryo. The original cut of this video was about 1 hour 15 minutes long. I thought, there is no way someone would watch me talk about a side character for that long, that's absurd. So I cut out some stuff where I thought I may be reaching too much or taking too long to come to a point, and ended with the final version that was about 50 minutes, and even then I was a bit nervous to be honest. But as it turns out, it became one of my best doing videos, so I am very much glad that Yao could enjoy it. 
Now, when it comes to talking about Shadowbringers, I am actually not nervous at all. I am sure you are thinking, what more could be said about Shadowbringers that hasn't been discussed at length over the past two and a half years? Yes, everyone knows this game had an amazing story. What could this man possibly add that wasn't already said? But let me pose a question. Would you consider that Shadowbringers is a game that deserves this kind of attention? That as a work of art, the amount of enthusiasm and appreciation towards this game is justified? That the greatest Final Fantasy story told within our generation deserves more than 5 minutes of discussion? For me at least, the answer is a resounding yes. And that is why, for this video, I will be going in with no holds barred. Because I genuinely feel that with a story like this, there is plenty enough substance to discuss the game in great detail for hours upon hours. And I am not talking about rambling or random chatter or drifting thoughts. I am talking about actual thought-provoking, rich, insightful discussion about the design of the game's world, its characters, of the plot, of the writing in general, as well as sound slash music design, and its myriad themes and inspirations. So yes, this video will most likely appear much longer than my regular content as I will try to cover certain things to the greatest extent that I feel is feasible to do so, but for an amazing game such as this, I wouldn't have it any other way. But as always, I will feature a lot of timestamps which will hopefully help with the video length. Sorry to keep dragging on this opening segment, but I feel it's important to bring this up. There will be spoilers from Final Fantasy XIV all the way to 5.3. There might be some brief mentions of 5.4 slash 5.5 as well. And I will also be discussing side content. So I highly recommend that you have finished the MSQ and done all of the Chronicles of a New Era questlines prior to watching this video. In addition, I will be featuring spoilers for other mainline Final Fantasy titles. Now, do not worry if you haven't played all the mainline entries. Should there be a major spoiler, I will give a warning and a timestamp to skip it. Normally, I try to be gentle with spoilers regarding other Final Fantasy games and I try to be as vague as I possibly can when bringing them up. But in this particular video, it's non-negotiable. I have to draw parallels between Shadowbringers and other Final Fantasy titles when it comes to talking about a certain theme, town, character, or whatever the case may be. Not just because it's easier to get the point across with a comparison, but also because it might have potentially been a source of inspiration for the developers as well. As well as, well, it's what I was reminded of, so I want to share it, I guess. This point will also come back later. It may seem a bit redundant on the surface, but I myself think it's actually quite important to talk about. We know that the developers of Final Fantasy XIV are huge fans of the series. You don't even need to look into interviews or the fact that these devs worked on past FF titles for evidence. You only need to look at the game itself and its myriad references to previous games. So I feel it may come across as a bit disingenuous if I didn't bring up whenever I will find it relevant to adding potentially more context. So yes, I will try my best to point out these potential inspirations whenever they come up. But please keep in mind that when I do so, I'm not insinuating that that's where the idea came from, because only the writers and the developers can tell us what actually were their inspirations. Think of it more as being mere guesswork. And I also want you to bear in mind that everything here is just my opinion. I do of course try to back up whatever I'm saying uh, with as much logic as I possibly can, but ultimately this analysis is still done through my own lens and a lot of it will be subjective. In this segment, I will attempt to explain my own view and why I find Shadowbringers to be such a huge deal for me at a personal level. If you don't want to watch it because you find it cringe or you just don't care about my own investment into the series, feel free to just slide over to the next chapter. Anyway, if you're still here, I assume you wish to hear my story, which I do appreciate. To fully communicate my relationship with Shadowbringers, we gotta start all the way from the beginning. 
<laughs> no, not that far back. When I was just a wee lad. See, my mom used to be a little bit, let's say, stingy when it came to buying game consoles. When the PS2 came out, I was still playing on our old SNES console, and to be honest, I hated it at the time, because I was upset when all my friends had the PlayStation 2, while I was stuck playing this 16-bit, nearly a decade old hardware. Well, eventually, after much begging, my mom caved in and bought the PS2 for me. Now, I don't recall if it was a Christmas or a birthday gift, since they are somewhat close for me. Anyway, what game did she buy along with it? It's this one game you may have heard of. It's called Final Fantasy X. The game was actually quite popular at the time, and I did have a previous interaction with the series. Kind of. So it was a no-brainer for her to purchase that for me. Now, I don't remember exactly when this was, but I am pretty sure it was around 2003 or 2004, because uh, 10.2 had already come out or was coming out. Uh, as I remember asking for that game on my next birthday. Of course, back then I couldn't fully appreciate everything the game had to offer. After all, I struggled to even understand the game as I barely understood English. Though games like FF10 were big in helping me learn said language eventually. In fact, I remember having to use the game manual that was written in Finnish to identify some of the status effects like Poison or Berserk because I did not understand what they did. And it even allowed me to understand a lot of the plot and the characters because it had these uh, summaries, again in Finnish, on characters like Yuna and her journey towards becoming a high summoner like her father. Yes, really, I understood it all from the manual. I mean, come on, I was like 6 or 7 at the time. But despite this scuffed experience, playing that game all the way through, I was the happiest kid in the world. I then went on to play some of the older titles, like the GBA releases of 4, 5 and 6 when those came out, FF12 when that game released, some non-mainline titles and the PSX titles through the online store for the PlayStation 3, which I had begged my brother to buy so that I could get the much-hyped Final Fantasy XIII on that, which would release in a few years. And then the series and Square as a whole slowly went to shit. I don't want to focus on this aspect too much, but I basically had an immense amount of consumer trust built up on Square Enix and it slowly waned to the point that I really didn't care about their releases anymore. I think for those who were also fanboys of Square at the time remember this period and can very much relate to what I mean here. It was just a bunch of bad releases and dumb decisions one after the other and eventually I just couldn't take it. I was pretty much done with them. So I stopped looking to the future and instead looked into the past Quite ironic given the game we're talking about here, but yeah, I would replay all those golden era titles many times over, visiting message boards and gushing about those old games with other fans, and that's how I was still enjoying Square, by basically limiting myself to the time when they were still making those good games. This situation then changed in early 2017, when I read a Kotaku article about there being an Ivalice themed raid added to FF14. I mentioned earlier that there were a few other titles I played that were not part of the mainline FF series. Well, Tactics was one of those games. I was a huge fan of Mr. Matsuno's work, so when I read on this article that they had the man himself working on this project, it acted as a hook to get me into FF14. I was pleasantly surprised, as you can probably guess. I enjoyed Realm Born, I enjoyed Heavensward, and I enjoyed Stormblood. Those were amazing experiences on their own, right? But you all probably heard the saying that trust arrives on foot and leaves on horseback. Even though I had been playing the game for 2-3 to three years prior to Shadowbringers coming out, I wouldn't really say my faith in Square had been restored, if that makes sense. I was always kind of skeptical of new patches in F14, and seeing when I would stop enjoying it. After all, that's what happened previously, and our brains do love looking for patterns. You could even say that perhaps on a subconscious level, 
This kind of mentality of expecting the game to flop at some point hindered my enjoyment of those prior expansions. Maybe it did or perhaps it didn't, who's to say for sure. Anyway, what is the point of this segment? Why is this man explaining his life story to the internet? Because I feel it's important to convey just how important Shadowbringers was to me. You see, those previous expansions served as that initial spark. But it was 5.0 where those flames were really kindled in terms of getting me to truly enjoy a Final Fantasy title again. When I played this game, it resonated so strongly with me. I legit felt like when I was enjoying those past titles such as 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, etc. as a kid. I was genuinely enjoying a new Final Fantasy title and just like that, my consumer trust came back. And I am now excited for Endwalker. After a decade of not caring about Final Fantasy, I am finally excited for the release of a new title. The fact that this singular title managed to not only completely mend the view I had of a company that I had thought to be a shadow of its former self, but also allow me to relive an experience on par with those so-called Golden Era titles, to me simply speaks volumes on just how much of an impact this game had on me. Yes, it's an amazing story, but for me personally it was so much more than that. It was a game that brought me back to a franchise that I had seen as lost to me, a franchise that I used to hold dear, that I no longer need to hold dear because there is an actual future now. Before even discussing important parts of the actual story portrayed in Shadowbringers, we should talk about the lead up to the expansion itself, because Shadowbringers had probably the most interesting lead up that we saw. So let's rewind back to late 2018 slash early 2019 and I will walk you through the kind of an environment around the community at the time of the lead up to Shadowbringers. Let's start by asking. So. Uh, everybody here, where do you think Pat, uh, Expansion 5.0 will take the Warrior of Light? Moon! The moon! Moon! Maybe that's 7.0. As the Six Nations now stood united against the Garlean threat and with war on the horizon, we finally got to take the fight to Garlean mode. Finally, after many years of waiting, we would enter the northern continent of Ilzabar and get to learn more about the ins and outs of this dark empire that has ever loomed from the shadows as a never-ending threat to our way of life. In 4.5, we even got to step foot into Ilzabar, albeit at the western border and only briefly. Patches 4.4 and part 1 of 4.5 were awesome as we were finally getting some big payoffs from what we set out to do in Stormblood as we see Uda, Ridania, Limsalominsa, Iskard, Alamigo and Doma all join together to fight the tyranny of the Empire. We get to learn some more sinister aspects of the Empire such as the Emperor's true motivations and his willingness to use whatever measures necessary to fulfill those ambitions, as well as the Empire itself being founded to serve the needs of the Asians, just like the Alagan Empire a long time ago. It seemed like the Asians and the Garlean Empire were more or less intertwined, though the expansion wouldn't be huge just because it will feature more Garlean mode, but also due to having us figure out more stuff about the Asians. And of course, in the first fanfest, they would further reveal that we would discover what Zodiac and Heidelin are, in addition to the story of the Asians coming to a close. As an expansion, it seems like a rather smooth continuation from Stormblood and it's all very exciting stuff. Then we find out, only about 3 months before the expansion was set to release, that no, we won't be going to Garlem mode, but rather to this shard. This in itself seemed rather baffling. We had a really strong build up towards going to Garlem mode, and there was still a lot left to explore in the source, 
So it seems a little odd to already introduce interdimensional travel to the story of FF14. This was paired with a handful of features that rubbed people the wrong way. The addition of Woolmates as a limited job and its terrible level 50 release, adding two new races that each only have one gender option, plus being limited in terms of hairstyles and headpieces, the simplification and homogenization of all roles just slash jobs across the board, dancer being a physical range instead of a healer, and so on. This was paired alongside the final MSQ patch feeling a bit lacking for many people. As for the reason the patch disappointed some, there's a few. Estinian being Deus Ex Machina, the hooded figure being intentionally vague, the solo instance itself, the credits being longer than the story portion, but the most notable factor being that you got to know very little about the first or why it's so urgent. In a way, it seemed like a filler story given that the ending was setting up the Garland mode way more than it did the first. It also didn't help that they had the last fanfest a few days before the final MSQ patch, which kind of ruined that particular patch for those who watched the fanfest prior to playing it. Please note that I am not saying that these are necessarily my own feelings on it, rather it's what I saw in the community around that time. Of course, this was contrasted by a lot of things to get excited about. Just to mention a few things here, we finally got the long anticipated gunblade job. We have Ishgard restoration, plenty of cool new zones and there were certainly tons of people that did appreciate the mystique of going to a whole another shard. And of course, the whole becoming the warrior of darkness aspect got pretty much everyone hooked as to how that was going to be implemented into the story alongside the fact that we would finally learn more about the Asians as well as Heidelin and Joe the Ark. I think that these positive aspects, alongside the heavy marketing surrounding Shadowbringers, still help to keep the amount of hype relatively high, but as far as shifting the focus of the expansion from Garlemot to the first, most of the opinions I saw on it were either relatively neutral, basically, eh, I guess we'll see how they do it, or they, it decreased their excitement slightly. Since I like to ask questions in these videos, let us begin then by asking why? Why did they shift the focus of the expansion? Now, there is an answer to this given by Mr. Yoshida, but before we get to that, I want you to entertain the idea so we can have a better understanding of it. Let's start off with the obvious reasons. 1. To give us the story of the Asians. 2. To have us become the warrior of darkness. 3. To prevent the 8th umbral calamity. And 4. To help out the scions. What all of these have in common is that they aren't really relevant to consider as they can be either done by having us remain in the source or where conflicts create specifically for the first to have us go there. So let's move on to the more interesting aspects and consider them from the writer's perspective. Here's the main three I could think of. 1. To subvert the player's expectations by going for something they did not expect. 2. To allow the riders more liberties when creating the expansion by having a completely new landscape. 3. Better understanding the consequences of a calamity. Alright, starting off with number 1. Subverting expectations. Yes, Everyone expected us to go to Garla mode. Not even since 4.4 or 4.5, but since 4.0. It just makes sense. The last expansion focused on liberating both Doma and Alamigo, so now is the ideal time to finally knock on the Emperor's door and deal with this problem that has been bothering us since 1.0. It's what everyone expects, while traveling to another dimension is the last thing on people's minds. So yeah, I get it. You want to surprise people and especially given that an average people on the internet has the attention span of a cottage cheese, it even seems sensible to always want to give your audience a nice little surprise here and there. I myself have always been a fan of what George R. R. Martin has said on the subject. I said, well, what do, what do I do with that? What do I do with that? The, yeah, these people have guessed the secret that I'm going to reveal in book six 
people have already guessed that here, and book two is just out. You really have two choices there. You can ignore it and proceed with your plan, despite the fact that some people know where you're going. Or you can get all panicky and say, oh my God, they figured it out. I can't let that be. I'll have to change it. I'll have to go in a different direction. And I, th I think some writers do that. And I think that's always mm. a mistake. Yeah. You know, if you've planned your book that the butler did it, and then you read an internet, someone has figured out that the butler did it, and you suddenly change in midstream, and it was the chambermaid who did it, mm. then you screw up the whole book because you get these, this foreshadowing early on, and you've got these little clues you planted. Now they're dead ends, and you have to introduce other clues, and you're retconning. It's a mess. So. I think it's fine to do something predictable, because if some people find it to be the expected outcome, then it means you have done a good job at planting those seeds and the ones that pay attention can see your ideas before they manifest. So my personal take is that, no, it's not a good idea to go for it because it would catch everyone who expected us to go into Garland Mode by surprise. Moving on to number two, allowing more freedom for the riders. This is a sound idea on paper, but keep in mind that we knew so little about the Garlean Empire, meaning there is definitely a lot of creative freedom there. But even ignoring that, there are still places in the source we know very little about. The New World is basically the equivalent of Northrand in terms of how much we know about it. Not to mention the Moon. In other words, I am not sure if having us go to a completely another world was all that necessary, seeing as there were plenty of places that are rather mysterious in the source to begin with. However, I do can understand the desire to have the players experience something completely else for a change, and then have them return to the source. This does allow for some very nice world building opportunities. You could also say that going into a completely new world allows them to do certain things they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise, and I will actually touch on that when we get to talking about the actual Shadowbringer story. Finally, number 3, raising the stakes for a calamity. In A Realm Reborn, we got to see just how devastating a calamity was, which was great for having us understand what's at stake if we would let another calamity happen. But with an expansion like Shadowbringers, you can take it one step further and have us better connect to the other side of the story. That is to say, the people in those shards. This is definitely a positive, because it's worth mentioning that we did already grow an affiliation with characters from another shard, namely with Unum Kalhai, as well as Artbird and the Warriors of Darkness. We did get to see how the world was precious to them, giving us that understanding that if we were to allow a calamity to happen, a lot of dreams and hopes, such as theirs, would be lost as well. However, having an entire expansion focus on it definitely does hammer in that understanding a lot better. Whether you think it needed this much dedication to reach that effect though, it's up to you to consider. Of course, there's a ton of reasons you could think of for why you would want to do this as a writer, but these are the main three I want to focus on, and I'll explain why in a bit. But there's something I have not talked about yet, and it's something that some of you may have thought of by this point. What about the 3.4 storyline? Obviously, they planned this really far in advance, that 5.0 was always going to be an expansion taking place in the first, and going to Garland mode was, a, was always intended as a red herring for 5.0. Well, in a recent Famitsu interview with Yoshida, we found out that that isn't really the case. Based on Yoshida's wording here, the decision to make the expansion take place in another shard happened sometime after Stormblood's release, Due to him feeling that players might have become bored with the conventional approach and formula to expansions, and to go off the rails for this one. In this response, he also gives explanations that tie to all the three reasons I just talked about. Now, the reason for this is probably that they did always intend to have an expansion take place in the first, thus setting it up all the way back in 3.4. However, they probably did not plan to use that card so soon, which makes sense considering how much left of the source was left to be explored, as in it would have been their trump card when players thought there is no more content left to explore on the source. It's quite interesting to consider whether this was actually the right choice from a storytelling perspective. 
What do I mean by this? Consider the impact the players would have if in Endwalker they finished the Zodiac Hydaelyn arc and saved the world from the final days or whatever the conclusion to Endwalker will be. Then you can drop this massive bombshell on them. Now that you've saved this world, look, there's these other worlds that need saving too. And it's possible that with a proper conclusion to the story on the source, and not needing to juggle the whole Empire and Ascian thing along with it, we could have gotten a more fleshed out and smoother transition into entering the first, as well as potentially being more hyped to do so. But of course I am not saying that I am right or that the dev team was wrong to choose the path they did. I am simply wanting to open this situation a bit to you guys so you can have some food for thought. That's my point with this whole segment, really. Furthermore, when I discuss the community perception towards the expansion in the lead up to the release, you can better appreciate that perhaps the success of Shadowbinger's story wasn't always all that set in stone, which can make us appreciate the brilliant writing all the more. Because Stormblood was already somewhat divisive for some, as in there were those who thought stories started to get slacking compared to what they enjoyed with Heavensward, and had the writing not been up to snuff with Shadowbringers, this factor alongside the whole pulling the rug from under the players in regards to not going to Garland mode, would have made this expansion a flop, for sure. But they knew what they were doing and we got an incredible experience instead. So this is all really just a long-winded way of me showing my appreciation and admiration to Miss Ishikawa, the writers, Mr. Yoshida, the dev team, everyone who worked towards bringing us this outstanding story. Now that we've spent some time understanding why they decided to have us go to the first, let's talk about the actual story content leading up to Shadowbringers. Obviously, this storyline begins all the way back in post Heaven's World with the introduction of the Warriors of Darkness. It's kind of funny thinking back to how that whole story arc was actually pretty hated back then, and now it's beloved by everyone for the amazing foreshadowing. I think it's a good reminder that it's always worthwhile to wait for the writers to show all of their cards. To go more into detail, what the story arc does is plant some ideas into the player's heads. The most important thing is understanding that people living in those shards are real people, which it kind of sounds funny when I put it that way, but what I mean is that they are people with real aspirations and dreams, basically. Uh, this is something that one can safely assume regardless, but having it be conveyed to us in this manner is an awesome way to demonstrate that point. This will not only further make us understand why stopping a calamity is so, so important, but it also helps to make our eventual trip to the first that much smoother, because they continue the storyline of Atbert and his companions in there. Another brilliant technique used in that questline that became prevalent especially during the wait for Shadowbringers to release was telling us how Otward and the others did what was deemed the right thing by fighting the Asians and them winning too much caused their world to become unbalanced, meaning their world became in danger of dying due to upsetting the balance. Of course, this aspect gets detailed more in Eden's promise that it wasn't white as black as white as they painted it back then, but this overall sentiment remained true. Nevertheless, this idea being planted all the way back then and having it resurface in the patches leading up to Shadowbringers no doubt helped soften the blow of us not going to Garland mode after all. Since we assumed that if we keep fighting and defeating Asians, the world will become unbalanced and the same thing will happen as did to Artbird's world which gave us a whole another dimension of approaching the story instead of simply okay, we defeat bad guys and get win, since by this point, the game mainly tells you that to stop calamities is to stop the Asians, prevent primals from being summoned and all that fun stuff. So now there was an additional layer to it. Granted, back then we did not really understand the whys and hows of this, seeing as a key piece of the puzzle was missing at the time, that being the extra knowledge on calamities. But this really helped their case, I feel, as it caused a lot of speculation by the players in the lead up to the expansion, which is always a good thing, 
making players actually think about the world you have created and how events could potentially unfold. This point also goes hand in hand with the whole Warrior of Darkness idea. Once it was revealed to us with the first fanfest, players of course would go back and think about the Warriors of Darkness in Heavensward, which then caused a lot of wild speculation on how us becoming the Warrior of Darkness is going to work. Will we work with the Ashians? Are we going to do bad things as to not upset the balance? How will the Warrior of Light transform into the Warrior of Darkness? And many, many questions like these. They may seem rather silly to think about now, but back then it made sense because the portrayal of the Warriors of Darkness, as well as the Ashians, were rather antagonistic. So it's a logical thing to assume, I would say. I myself always had doubts about our character becoming evil or whatever. I didn't really buy that idea, but I was nonetheless intrigued by how that whole change was going to happen. In a way, Shadowbringers made us think about how things were going to work a lot more in the lead-up than Heavensward or Stormblood did, and of course they would continue this trend in Endwalker, leaving plenty of very interesting things for us to speculate about. Of course, you also had the setup with Minfilia and Arbert's crew that would come into play big time in Shadowbringers, but at the time we didn't have that much insight as to what that entailed. Then you have the immediate lead up to the expansion with the last patches of Stormblood. This was definitely an interesting way to segue into the expansion. I love how it's having some really good payoffs for the Stormblood story, where you finally have Alamigo join the Eorzean Alliance, you see most of Othard unite as Doma's allies, and the Six Nations finally face off against the Garlean Empire in all-out war, as everyone is desperately clinging to their liberty and refusing to be shackled again by Garla mode. You even have a parley with the freaking Emperor himself. Also, you see the Eorzean Alliance finally starting to get a little more smart and actually playing the political game by using subterfuge to their advantage to cause trouble in Garla mode without firing a single shot. The dungeon, as with all the final dungeons of an expansion, has a very heroic and climactic vibe to it, and the final solo instance Though it did apparently cause some people trouble. Yes, really. I found it to be awesome with how you are fighting as Hien, Yugiri, and Lise against Elidibus Xenos while the Warrior of Light is slowly approaching. It really helps put into perspective just how important you are as the protagonist, that they are literally just stalling and waiting on your arrival, and it's much better emphasized by having you play as them and you are just hoping that you would arrive soon because it's not going too well for them. I mean, they are really struggling. But the fact that they do can hold their ground for such a long while it still does reflect on how strong those three have gotten since Stormblood. And there's also a nice feeling when you fight him as the Warrior of Light, and that attack, Concentrativity, which used to one-shot you in your earlier encounters with the real Xenos, would knock back you in the later ones and now you are just tanking it without caring much about it. It's a subtle thing, but that too does help to drive home just how powerful your character has gotten throughout Stormblood. Also, the fact that Elidibus has powerful magic, what an unsundered Ashian would have, and being in a body of one of the strongest Garleans out there, and still you manage to take him down and are still more than ready to go for round 2. Basically, awesome final dungeon and awesome solo instance at the end. Also, there's some awesome optional dialogue, such as how certain guild masters address the condition of the Scions, or from Unukanghai, where you get to draw a sort of a parallel between the 13th and the 1st, which serves to put further intrigue as you wait for Shadowbringers in the upcoming months, and putting more importance into wanting to save this, uh, this shard. But while you are getting some payoffs for Stormblood, what's pretty awesome is that despite it feeling a bit abrupt where you go into Shadowbringers, there's actually a nice amount of foreshadowing, which was especially apparent when I did it in New Game Plus. You have the Scions slowly being called. Many characters are talking about Ashians and how important it is to finally deal with them, you get people noticing this weird phenomenon where the etheric density in areas all over the world have been reduced, suggesting how the imbalance of the state of the first is bleeding into the source. 
and you of course have both songs Zos Carbus and Xenos being played by the two unsundered Asians. All of this being nice setup for Shadowbringers and what it will be tackling. And then yeah, you of course have the big moment where the enigmatic figure finally manages to talk to you and then began the long wait of three months as your character waits for something to be found near the crystal tower. And what did I do for Shadowbringers? Main scenario, main scenario plan for 5.0. Oh, yeah. Okay, so she's overwhelmed. Shadowbringers was very different from the previous two expansions. Now, you might say, of course it was different. You went to another shard, you learned more about the Asians, you fought to restore darkness to the realm. That's not what I mean. It had different themes that drove the narrative from the previous ones, as well as a different topic, as is to be expected. But I mean that the expansion was fundamentally different from a design philosophy standpoint and this, I believe, is mostly due to the fingerprint of the people that worked on Shadowbringers. I should clarify that the amount of developers remained relatively the same, but in Shadowbringers, we did see some fresh blood get into some of the more prominent uh, roles of game design. When it comes to talking about FF14, from a realm born to present day, there is one individual that has had a lot of influence on the series. Yasumi Matsuno. For those of you who do not know who I'm talking about, Mr. Matsuno made some great games such as Tactics Ogre and then joined Square to go on to make the titles we now know as Ivanese games, Tactics, Vagrant Story and FF12. Though he didn't work all the way through on 12, but he nonetheless contributed. But why is he relevant to the discussion about FF14? Well, you see, he and his games have been a big influence on the development of F14 throughout the years. From writing, to character design, to world building, to UI, to art direction. This is from developers that have either worked on F12, or developers that simply admired his work and took inspiration from it, which by the way, yes, does include Mr. Yoshida himself, who is probably the biggest fanboy of Mr. Matsuno in existence. This in itself is a topic that could be talked about for two hours, but I'll just leave a very insightful reddit post here in the description if you wish to read more. My point is that F14 was heavily influenced by the Ivalice games, and of course you had people who worked on games like FF12 also contributing a lot, but in Shadowbringers, they put some of the more fresh members into the forefront, allowing them more liberty and room to shine, Writers, artists, raid slash fight designers, etc. Now, I won't list all such cases, but I do want to point out three notable examples of people who contributed a lot to Shadowbringers, who joined the company around 2013 for F14 and did not work on 12 or any previous F titles. Starting with Saki Takayanagi, who is a quest designer and joined Square Enix in 2013 to work on A Realm Born. She primarily oversees NPC design and as far as I understood, most of her work involved those kinda side NPCs you see in towns and such, but she actually got to work on slash adjust a major character in Shadowbringers, that being Tancred, who was one of my favorites from this story, so she definitely did a good job there, whatever the changes were that she put forth. Next, we have Masayoshi Soken. Yes, he is very much synonymous with F14 music, however I am bringing him up here because there is a very crucial detail to keep in mind. This was the first expansion 
where he got to develop the main team. The previous ones, Answers, Dragon Song, and Revolutions, were all composed by Nobuo Uematsu. You might think it's only one song out of the entire soundtrack, who cares? But it just so happens that that one song is the single most important song from the entire soundtrack of the expansion. The main theme is the very first song that fans will hear, meaning it's the first impression that will set their expectations for this story. It also sets the tone and the theme for the rest of the music in the expansion, as well as obviously setting up the bass melody slash leitmotif that will be used throughout most of the songs. Also consider how iconic Answers and Dragon Song are compared to basically any other F14 song. In essence, I think Mr. Soken getting to do the theme song on his own was huge and perfectly serves as Mr. Uematsu passing the torch. I'd love to talk more about this point, but I will have an entire section at the end dedicated to talking about the music and sound design in Shadowbringers, so uh, please look forward to it as they say. Now for the final example, before I get to that though, indulge me for a moment if you will. Please raise your hand if in your opinion, the best 8-man story is Binding Coil of Bahamut. The best 24-man story is Crystal Tower. The best job quest story is Dark Knight. If you prefer the Doman Half 4.0 over the Alamegan Half, I am willing to bet that most of you watching this agreed with the majority of those, if not straight up all of them. The person who wrote all of these? I mean, yeah, I know who it is and probably waited for me to mention them this entire segment. Look, I just wanted to hold you guys in suspense. Anyway, yes, I am referring to Natsuko Ishikawa. She too joined the company in 2013 to work on Romy Born. There are two other writers that has had a lot of influence on F14, those being Katsutoyo Mahiro and Banri Oda. Mr. Mahiro, who was the main writer for Realm Reborn and 3.0, straight up worked on all three Evangelist based games, and Mr. Oda, main co writer of Heavensward, Stormblood, and Shadowbringers, has said in an interview that he was influenced by Tactics Ogre for a lot of his writing in F14. What sets Mish Ishikawa apart from those two? is that she, as far as we know, doesn't have this strong influence left by Mr. Matsuno's work, and I think this very much reflects in her work, in how different it feels from the other two. Not necessarily better or worse, but different. Also, just so I don't sound like I'm discrediting her, she is of course a brilliant writer in her own right. I am not implying that her success came purely because she was different. She definitely knows how to write some incredible characters, and she's really good at not just writing a scene, but also playing it out in her head thoroughly and offering a lot of assistance to the developers to better have the scene come into fruition in a way that she intended. And we also know that she's very open to feedback from Yoshida and other devs, which no doubt have helped improve her skills over the years. I can't stress this enough, getting feedback from others and getting more perspectives is so, so important to writing a compelling story. In A Realm Born and Heavensward, her work was mostly on either the slower sort of lead-up to the climax patches, or on Chronicles of a New Era side quests. Then, in 4.0, she got a little more liberty as she got to write the entire Doman portion of 4.0. It was then, in summer of 2017, not too long after the launch of 4.0, that she would start her work on Shadowbringers in a major role, being responsible for writing most of the 5.0 story. A huge career opportunity, to be sure. To be more specific, she was the lead main scenario writer for 5.0 as well as 5.3 later down the line, Though her work obviously did involve more than just the writing, as she was also a planner and a game designer, meaning she'd be involved in things like concepts for new areas, reviewing and requesting as well as planning the use of background music, making proposals regarding the story, gauging the cost of animations, you know, things of that nature. There were of course other developers that got their opportunity to shine in the expansion, 
I mainly just brought up the most important ones, so I don't want to sit here all day listing developers and their work. In summary, for Shadowbringers, they kind of had some of their strong core step back a little and allowed some of the more quote unquote fresh people, uh, in other words, those not as heavily influenced by Mr. Matsuno's work, have more liberty to show their efforts to the world. And the reason I think this was brilliant and why it paid off as big as it did was that the entire expansion of Shadowbringers was fundamental. So, let us discuss what actually were these differences in how the story was approached. In the PAX West 2019 dev panel, Miss Ishikawa gives us a solid rundown of just what these thought processes were going into the design of Shadowbringers, so I will present those points here and supplement it with my own thoughts. She starts off with Yoshida's core ideas for the expansion, which at first were twofold. One, was to have us visit another shard, that being the first. Since we already discussed this at length, I won't go over this point. The second core idea was to implement this trust system, where you can take the scions and other important characters into the dungeon with you. The aim here was of course to have a much more typical RPG experience, uh, as one might see in a single player game, where you go through this journey with your party members. Now, FF14 has always been a game that many describe as an RPG first and an MMO second, in that there is an exceptionally strong focus on the narrative for being an MMO. When designing this system though, the developers had to consider the pros and cons of implementing it. Because while it does enhance the story experience, FF14 is also an MMO and implementing this trust system would be yet another aspect where they have to basically battle the MMO aspect of the game when designing the story. Since, due to F14 being built as an MMO, it may not necessarily fit the structure for that kind of a single player JRPG style. And so, they stop to think about it, how F14 has been operating for the past 5 years, and about how F14 is a Final Fantasy, but is also an MMORPG, and this line of thinking eventually led them to the conclusion of okay, how about we make Shadowbringers a Final Fantasy where its story strives not in spite of being an MMO, but because of it. In other words, what aspects of it being an MMO could we use to our advantage? And so, when development on the expansion began, Miss Ishikawa and the developers went into it with this mindset strongly in mind. Let's go over some of the ways the developers made use of this mindset. Making greater use of past content to create a story that would otherwise be difficult or near impossible on such a grand scale. This could range from things like animations and props when talking on a microscopic level, and on a more macroscopic level making use of entire characters and plotlines from past content. This seems like a no-brainer on paper, of course you would want to heavily use resources that are already there so that there's less work, but I think the reason it wasn't done in previous expansion, or at least not to the extent that it was done in Shadowbringers, was because when you do that, you really risk ending up relying on it too much. Like instead of writing something new, you simply copy paste whatever was used previously, and then it becomes a crutch. This in itself can be very harmful, so you need to do it in moderation, and I think Miss Ishikawa managed to strike a perfect balance when it came to this. The way she wrote the Crystal Exarch slash Grahatia as well as the Crystal Tower in general is a prime example of this. Yes, if you experience the storylines involved in those, you most likely appreciate it a bit better, but she made sure to write the Crystal Exarch in a way that you don't rely on that past knowledge. As in you can fully appreciate and come to grow to like him throughout the journey in Shadowbringers even without that connection. The Crystal Tower, she didn't simply just Ctrl plus V slap it into Northrand and expect you to remember all of the Crystal Tower story to get why it's significant, because throughout Shadowbringers, the whole thing of the Crystal Tower being the beacon of hope for mankind is emphasized by its symbolism to the people of the Crystarium and yes, we'll be discussing that at length later. 
3.4 storyline is another one. Since it was so brief and was preceded by the Stormblood expansion, a lot of people most likely forgot about this questline, if not completely then at least some of its details. So instead of relying on the player remembering, the story of Artbird and his companions is emphasized once again in Shadowbringers in great detail, I might add, and their story gets a lot more context. I could keep listing these examples here, but I think you get the idea I'm going for. The way those past storylines were used was brilliant, because the story of Shadowbringers can be enjoyed independently. However, if you did do those storylines and did pay attention, they will further enhance the experience. This was an awesome decision because it rewards the players who did optional content and remembers what happened in them, and it makes the narrative feel much larger because that optional content you did 5 years ago? Yeah, it actually comes full circle here. A big issue I always had is that some of the biggest threats we ever face happen in optional content, but they are never brought up in the MSQ. We're talking about some really high level world ending threats like Alexander, Omega and so on. These stories were done and then forgotten about, basically just brushed to the side, which kinda cheapens the hurdles we overcame and the victories we achieved because they never mattered in the grand scheme of things. Now, this isn't all a bad thing, because obviously those side quests did do a lot of world building, as a great deal about the setting is learned by doing them, which was always a big reason to still pay attention to those stories. But what they managed here in Shadowbringers was nothing short of awesome, as connecting those past storylines in a smart way, again, not as a crutch but as a way to enhance, really makes those stories feel like they mattered and lets the writers make a story that feels much bigger than it would have otherwise been. I should also mention that another reason why having Miss Ishikawa be the lead scenario writer was a good call is because as I mentioned earlier, she had already worked on a bunch of side content. You're probably not surprised to hear that among the things she wrote were the Crystal Tower series, Omega, and in addition, she wrote the MSQ for Patch 3.4, all of which have a huge influence on the Shadowbringer story. I would also mention the fact that she wrote the Dark Knight storyline, which while it doesn't directly relate to the Shadowbringer story, is still very important thematically but that aspect won't be really examined until the second video. Making more use of the community aspect of the game and trying to move away from the stigma of how the story is just this purely solo experience and instead try to have the developers sort of nudge the players towards sharing their enthusiasm regarding the story. Subtle things like having more varied dialogue choices for better expression Having characters talk and react in a way that could be interpreted in multiple ways, things of that nature. Since this is very much a subtle thing, it's a bit difficult to get this point across by using examples, but I'll try my best here. First thing, dialogue choices. A lot more effort was put into allowing the player to express different kinds of thoughts. If you look at the dialogue options in the pictures I'm showing on screen right now, some of them might seem similar on the surface, but I bet that if I asked you which options you yourself went for on your playthrough, we could get a few conversations going and in fact I have done so in the past with uh, some of my friends. I also mentioned interpreting characters in a different way but I am not going to discuss that in this segment because I have an entire video dedicated to talking about the characters. I will say though that the trust dialogue in particular was another one where I would often go asking my friends sharing our experiences on what our characters said in a particular dungeon. Another method was by featuring random easter eggs, such as the ever-elusive shoe bill, which was, funnily enough, I have also gotten into plenty of discussions about as to what the true nature of that thing really was or if it was just a joke put in by the developers. Yet another interesting thing they tried in Shadowbringers was to make the story ever so slightly less linear, it's not much, and the story is still very linear as you would expect from both a GRPG and from an MMO, but they did try to at least break the mode a little bit, in at least two segments that I can recall of. The first choice being basically right at the start of the story, where you can choose between going to Amarang first for Alize or to Colusia for Alfino. 
The second was when you could do any of the four role quests to continue the story in the Tempest. Technically, this one wasn't as much of a choice, because the logical one to go for would obviously be the job that you are doing the MSQ on. But in theory, if you leveled a job with, within another role, or you went for Scholar slash Summoner, you could choose which role quests you want to finish. Or you could even finish multiple or even all of them before continuing. Which in theory would add to the ending due to getting more attached to Artbird and the story that he went through. So yes, these two choices, while not too mind-blowing, were still great additions, especially because we have come to expect FF14 to be incredibly linear with basically no choice at all in how you want to proceed in the MSQ. And so this helps a little bit in allowing for more player expression. The first one in particular, about choosing between Alize and Alfino, I remember having a dialogue with many of my friends about it on many an occasion. I also love those little moments in the story where you can get different outcomes. For example, in 5.2, you can choose which role quest and PC you want to talk to, or in 5.3, you have different outcomes for the competition with Alize. So this is definitely an aspect that they managed to nail quite well in Shadowbringers, I would say. Now, the third thing is partially connected to the last point. This was basically them trying to figure out, okay, how can we better integrate the player character, the Warrior of Light, into the story? You got this avatar that the players have gotten attached to over the years, so why not make use of that in the story and make them stand out more? In essence, the developers wanted you to better connect to your character and feel much more badass. They want you to take those screenshots where you do something cool or when something dramatic, tragic, amazing, whatever happens. And this is obviously a very unique opportunity as the last Final Fantasy RPG with an avatar as the protagonist was all the way back in F3, which in itself is a funny coincidence. The main way in which this was achieved, besides adding all those cool moments, was through animation work. The Warrior Flight in Shadowbringers is seen using a lot more of different kinds of movement and emotion, and they don't feel as stiff anymore. To go along with those core ideas of how to take advantage of F14 being an MMO, Miss Ishikawa then had to consider the overall structure for the story itself and she felt like Shadowbringers would benefit from going for a very traditional JRPG feel. She was mainly inspired by games she grew up with from the 90s, so the SNES and the PSX era. The mindset was essentially, what would I want to do in a Final Fantasy MMO? In other words, what elements from past Final Fantasy titles and other JRPGs would she want to incorporate into Shadowbringers to make it a Final Fantasy MMO experience? This is another reason I want to go over what I see as potential inspirations, as it would seem that with Mish Ishikawa having stated that she was heavily influenced by those games from the 90s. Though, as much of a fan I am of many different JRPGs, I will deliberately limit myself to mainline Final Fantasy titles for the most part, because otherwise, it's simply way too broad. This was pretty much the perfect setup with Shadowbringers. With her being able to write the main story elements all on her own, and the smaller scale of the world and the story in the first, she was able to write a story that is much more focused on being that sort of an old school JRPG and having a very stylized world setting. You see what I mean with the design behind the expansion falling into place perfectly? This then led to her first draft, which had things like Powerful ancients with a way advanced society whose downfall were caused by both their own awesomeness and hubris, as well as by a mystical force, a companion that constantly travels with the main character, and souls being a core plot point. Plot lines to make the player grow attached to the main party, the scions being very much your classic JRPG party with the amount of growth they go through, and so on. And this wouldn't all be complete without the omnipotent god who is the source of all the woes in the world that you face off towards the end of the game. This being was of course Eden, who was the sole light warden and the one responsible for all the light, and thus, when the party would defeat it, they would win. Well, you'd still have the whole Emmet Cell thing to deal with, but you get the idea. Basically, there was no watery and the numerous light wardens in the original draft. However, 
Mr. Yoshida wanted to much more heavily integrate the story element of the world being filled with light to the gameplay. This was a brilliant move, not just because gameplay story integration is one of the strongest cards to play when you tell a story in an interactive environment aka a video game, since you cannot do that in a movie, a book or, a, or whatever, but it also fits into that mindset I discussed earlier as it's something that you can only do in an MMO since the sky is dependent on your point in the story and thus can be different in another player's screen. I should also mention the more concrete things that Shadowbringers had going for it. Dropping 32-bit support allowed them much more freedom to do certain things due to being able to utilize more memory and the game had a bigger budget allowing them to do more things in order to tell the story they wanted to tell. But there's another point I want to discuss here. Why was it Shadowbringers that became so successful and not say Stormblood or Heavensward? Those past expansions are really awesome too. Well, my own interpretation is that it simply came down to marketing and even more importantly, timing. Shadowbringers was the first expansion in F14 that they really bothered to advertise properly. They had advertisements in Times Square in New York. They had that ad with Tom Holland becoming the Warrior of Darkness, all sorts of stuff like that. And this is just the big stuff on the surface. That's not even to speak of how widely this was marketed throughout the world. They pretty much went all out on advertising the game and it paid off. The other thing, as I said, is timing. COVID was huge for increasing the player numbers. Because everyone suddenly had a lot more free time at home, what better way to spend that free time than play some Final Fantasy XIV? They further took advantage of this by extending the free trial to include all of A Realm Reborn and all of Heavensward, which was huge. The amount of free content on display is just mind-blowing. And of course, in 5.3, they would also finally address the issue that many had with how some parts of A Realm Reborn and Post Realm Reborn were a bit too slow and did things like adding flying. Now, if that wasn't enough, then we had Blizzard making some blunders in regards to WoW, which caused this mass exodus of a crap ton of WoW content creators coming over and covering F14 on YouTube and on Twitch. I remember at the time when I saw a few WoW streamers coming over, I didn't think much of it, because this had already happened during Stormblood when BFA flopped. We had some WoW refugees come over. But as the months went on, I started to notice that this was way bigger, like way bigger. Obviously, Asmongold covering the game was massive, but there were so many WoW content creators, both big and small, sharing their enthusiasm towards the game. And then of course other things like Hironobu Sakakuchi himself playing the game and thoroughly enjoying it. I am sure that too helps some people to make the jump to try the game, for reasons I am confident I do not need to explain why. So in essence, Shadowbringers owes its success to the investment they put into properly advertising it and simply getting lucky, essentially, with COVID and with Blizzard messing things up. Now, I'm not insinuating that that was the sole reason and that Shadowbringers was a bad game that just got good advertisements and less exposure. Quite the contrary. I think the fact that the game was of exceptional quality further cemented its success because then you had word of mouth do the rest of the work. And obviously word of mouth was strong because of how great the game actually was. Which makes a good case example of how even though at first you might need a bit of exposure to get your product out there, what is the most important is that you pour your heart into it and you strive to make a genuinely great product and as long as your game is good, it ought to be successful. Granted, this isn't always the case unfortunately, there's definitely been great games that stay in obscurity, but I like to believe that this applies at least most of the time, and it certainly did here. Also, this is kind of a weird thing to share, like maybe it's just me, but I seem to come across many FF14 players who don't like FF7 that much, calling it overrated and all that. The part I find amusing about it is that Shadowbringers was to FF14 pretty much exactly what FF7 was to the FF series. The first one to be properly advertised, and the one that came out at the perfect time. Makes you wonder, because obviously FF7 didn't have this it's overrated stigma when it was fresh, because everyone was loving it. 
maybe way later down the line in 10 or 20 years people will be saying how overrated Shadowbringers was. <laughs> anyway, now I'm drifting into the realm of shower dots. Let's move on before I derail this whole thing. Right, so now we can finally get to talking about the story in Shadowbringers. And the best place to start is by going over the themes that were portrayed in the story. There are many themes present in Shadowbringers and I'm gonna share with you what I find to be the topic, the primary theme and the sub-themes of Shadowbringers. Keep in mind that everyone has a different interpretation on themes, so this in particular is something I'd be interested to hear any of you all's thoughts on. So first, the main topic of the story, the thing that is much more apparent on the surface and is indeed present in the title, Light versus Darkness. More specifically, the idea of light not being inherently good, darkness not being inherently evil, and the harmony of the two forces. This theme first appeared in Final Fantasy III, where the developers wanted to put an extra element to the whole Warrior of Light thing that was there in FF1. The idea was that you had to prevent darkness from prevailing once again by playing as the four warriors of light, but then, as you play the game, you find out that before the events of the game, the same type of scenario had already played out, just that it was the warriors of darkness that had to fight to prevent a flood of light in order to save the world setting this notion that darkness isn't evil and light isn't good, and that the balance of these two aspects is crucial. All of this should be sounding very familiar. Most of you already know this, but yes, this basic premise was heavily inspired by the plot and theme of Final Fantasy III, and indeed in many ways, Shadowbringers is a love letter to Final Fantasy III, as of course you have the Crystal Tower, Eternal Wind, and all that fun stuff going on as well. What some of you may not know, however, is that this theme was heavily present in Final Fantasy IV as well. See, in Final Fantasy III, this theme was based mainly on the plot. In FF4, it doesn't have as much bearing on the plot, but it's rather focused on the characters, which of course makes sense given FF4 was such a heavily character-driven game compared to previous entries. Cecil having to bid farewell to his bloodstained past by casting aside his darkness and becoming a paladin sets you up into thinking that light good, darkness bad, but then you find out that Gobes, someone who had a lot of darkness in him, was not an evil person, in fact he was very much a good person, but it was mainly through unfortunate circumstances that led him down the path he went for most of Final Fantasy IV. Shadowbringers combines both of these elements. The theme of light and darkness is important not only for the plot, but it also heavily drives many characters, again, both major and minor characters. Light being something that in-universe is tied to passivity is wonderfully written because not only is the world stagnated due to, you know, the destruction of society as a whole, but once again in a literal sense, with how light can be seen as a primordial force that enforces passivity and stillness. The primary theme of Shadowbringers is... If I had to put it into a single word, I would say that it is a theme of legacy, or of inheritance. Or as a certain song puts it, look to those who walked before, to lead those who walk after. Or as Urianje put it, to take what steps we may and thus mark the road for all those who would follow. But for the purposes of this video, I would just describe this as the theme of legacy, because it's less effort to call it that. It's also what inspired the title of the video, if you were curious. This theme of legacy applies to countless characters throughout the story, both major and minor, not only does it drive these characters, but it's also often set up as a hurdle, as an obstacle that a character has to overcome. The obstacle being that you should learn from the past and uphold the memories of those that came before, but not to dwell on the past so much that it will literally poison you. 
It is also not a static thing as this theme is viewed from many different angles. Let me point out some examples so you can get a better idea of what it is that I am talking about here in how this theme of legacy slash inheritance plays out in a few scenarios in the story. Reins, Minfilia's and Tancred's story deals with legacy in a familial form, where we see Reen struggling with walking in Minfilia's shadow, feeling weak and unable to carry the torch left by Minfilia until she's finally able to, thanks to traveling with the warrior flight, Tancred, Uriange, etc., and gain the confidence and the resolve to carry that burden, and then continue to keep that light of hope alive for the sake of future generations. This is an aspect of the theme that I reckon is the most likely to resonate with players, because we've all had to pretty much deal with it at some point in our lives. Whether it's siblings, parents, grandparents, there's always these expectations that are placed upon you, and you might feel like a disappointment to your family, the feeling that the legacy you leave behind won't live up to the family standard, that sort of stuff. It's certainly a thing that a lot of people struggle with, which I think is what makes the implementation of this theme in Rin's story really powerful. Artbird's story tells us how someone's legacy can be very easily tainted over time, where someone's image can become warped so thoroughly over time to be even the complete opposite of what they wear. Which, by the way, happens all the time in real life, and it is one of my biggest fears personally, which is a big reason for why Artbird's story resonated so strongly with me personally. The thought that something you do or say today, no matter how good willed, can be turned completely on its head in the distant future to fit someone else's agenda is, quite frankly, terrifying. Luckily, in Artbird's case, the warrior of light does eventually clear his name, but one can only wonder what would have happened if they didn't. People would still view him and his companions as being basically worse than Hitler. In this sense, it is not only for the warrior of light to overcome this team through him clearing up their names and defeating Elidibus to get him to surrender Arpert's body, but also it's something that Arpert himself needs to overcome. And he finally does, after Mount Gulg, in one of his character's most pivotal scenes where after spending the entire game up until that point regretting him and his companions' past actions, where even he himself felt let down by his failure enough to believe that the legacy of him and his companions was uh, attained at one, after spending time with the warrior of light and being able to reflect on his journey, he finally came to a realization and accepts that they did do the right thing and thus he can once again be proud of what they have accomplished and the legacy they would leave behind, which then comes full circle when the warrior flight finally does clear up their names. Another similar use of this theme and another very realistic portrayal of how history is viewed and the postmodern critique of history is found in the Kitari Beast Tribe, or really the story with the Ronka, the Vis and Ustola in general. For those who haven't done it or do not remember, in the Beast Tribe quests, you get to choose how certain parts of history are to be interpreted. This is such an interesting and refreshing take because, as I said, it's a realistic approach to how history is viewed and brings into question if there really is true history, so to speak. The entire legacy of Ronka, the Kitari, the Beast, and the Namazu, how they will be told for generations to come are left down to basically a handful of individuals and their own bias, which you, the player, of course, carrying the most bias when it comes to making this choice. A rather unique type of inheritance is with Krahatia, who carries the legacy of a doomed timeline, as well as that of Alag, and of course that plays an important part in his character, which further emphasizes the importance of him staying alive to carry on those memories. Also, how that ties in with how in the doomed timeline, what kept the people after the Eight Umbral Calamity going was the legacy left behind by the Warrior of Light and their tales of heroism. As I mentioned, it's not just the main characters that have to deal with this, many characters in this story deal with it. A prime example would be Magnus, 
who struggles to cope with the inheritance from his wife of what she left behind, in whose case it's a much more material kind of an inheritance as opposed to the previous examples. But if I was to list every example, <laughs> we'd be here all day. I am instead just gonna mention my final example, which is the single most important use of this theme. And that is when this theme is taken to its very extreme and shown how it can be negatively impacting. And this of course applies to none other than Emmet Selk. A character who is so borderline obsessed with protecting the legacy of the ancients that he's willing to go through anything and everything to bring them back. Even his final actions are fueled by this when he is defeated and upon realizing bringing them back is no longer an option, he asks the warrior flight to remember them so that their legacy lives on, if not physically by them being returned, then at least in the memories of the warrior flight. This then also strongly ties the team to the warrior flight, who ends up with the strongest burden of them all. This is what makes Emmet Selk such a well-written villain, because his story is taking this core theme, then taking it into its extreme so that it becomes diametrically opposed from the way the story portrays this theme as well as of the heroes. This is pretty much how to make an awesome villain one on one, and though it's bread and butter to write the story's villain to either stand in opposition of the primary theme of the story or show how the primary theme can be damaging when done in a certain way, particular execution of this with Emmet Selk was nothing short of incredible. Due to what we learn of how souls work in the Shadowbringer story, this theme is also tied to the story in a much more literal sense, as a soul of someone in the first corresponds to someone's soul in the source, and also everyone's souls are interconnected with the souls of the ancients. So not only do you carry on someone's memories, values, etc. in a traditional sense, but you also potentially carry them in a very literal sense, by way of you inheriting someone's soul. This was quite brilliant as it then further drives home this theme and I like to imagine that probably the reason this theme came to the forefront was due to Mish Ishikawa knowing that the story of Shadowbringers would have this reveal about the souls and thus she wrote the story to thematically work around that concept. Which shows some great adapting skills. Some people may view these as two distinct separate themes but for me I consider them to be a part of one and the same underlying theme, the importance of legacy slash inheritance and of preserving history, as well as the importance of the soul, or as Miss Ishikawa herself put it, the one who inherits the soul. At first I had this as a sub-theme, but I think it's much more fitting to put it as, uh, as a sort of something that falls under the umbrella of this primary theme and that's to do with memories. Memories are examined both in a figurative as well as in a literal sense throughout the story and of course they are the core theme in the Eden Raid series. It's this idea of memories being important because it is through the memories of your own past and the past of the others that you reflect on and can discover things about yourself and thus grow or whenever a character makes the deliberate choice not to which I think all ties in with the same theme about inheriting. It's worth noting that this theme that I have been talking about all this time, it can also be found in A Realm Reborn Heavensward and Stormblood and indeed in other Final Fantasy titles. But I think a key difference is that in the other expansions and previous FF titles, this was used more as a sub-theme, but in Shadowbringers it's the most integral theme when it comes to the story and I personally find it quite interesting that they chose to use this as the primary theme for the story. But hey, it paid off big time. So now we get into the sub-themes. I don't consider these as encompassing of the whole story as the primary theme I just talked about. They don't necessarily show up in every single thing throughout the story and dictate vast majority of the character's actions. But I find them to be prevalent enough and interesting enough that they warrant some discussion. For the first sub-theme we're going to be talking about, I'm going to straight up quote Mr. Yoshida for this one. Not betraying the path made by oneself, wherein the story portrays this idea of conviction that you shouldn't diverge from a path you have set yourself on. 
I should clarify that I am not referring to a team of preordained destiny, which do play an important role in games like FF8, FF12 and FF13. Rather, I am talking about a deliberate choice you have made to do something at some point in your life and staying true to that decision by not betraying that path, whether that be because you believe in those values, you think it's easier to stay on it, or whatever the case may be. It could also be summarized into a single word if you really want to. Conviction. This theme I would argue becomes a lot more prevalent in 5.3, but I do think it influences many of the characters' action throughout the entire Shadowbringers arc. This theme is especially depicted in a positive light when it comes to characters surrounding Ilmor, such as Chai Nuz and Kai Shear, where they found out they were doing the wrong thing and set a new course for themselves and we see how resolved they are to stay on that course. So we have that representation from even more minor characters of which I talked about with the earlier theme. In the main cast, it's more or less shown on all of them, but the notable ones include Grahatia and Urianje, who are especially interesting. They set themselves on this course to deceive the warrior flight and the other scions, because even though it hurt them to do it, they felt like it was the right thing. This was then painted in a negative light by the story, because it goes against the theme I talked about just now and the theme I'm going to talk about next. They go through with this plan and execute it, but it doesn't work, so they are now forced to set themselves up on a new path, this time in a positive way. Both of them then commit to their new path, at the influence of the rest of the party who don't want to see Grahatia sacrifice himself. A very cool way to use this theme for some character development, I especially love the scene with Urianje in the Crystarium after Mount Gulg. Very powerful scene. But it's also depicted in a negative light, especially with the villains. Ranjit, Votri, and Emmet Selk all have a strong conviction towards something that is either misguided or at the very least incredibly morally questionable and of course diametrically opposite to the party and the theme the game is portraying. However, while they are villains, the conviction they have is at least rationalized by the game and we are made to understand them. But there is one character whose portrayal of this team has basically zero positive elements. It's made up to be 100% a detriment and something that shows how bad this team of conviction gets when it's taken to its very extreme. An invocation of Eld. Though not of Hydaelyn's making. What are you? matters not. You are the enemy, and you will fall. Even should it cost me everything, I will not forsake my duty. That character is of course none other than Elidibus. We see in him someone who persists on the path he set himself on for all the wrong reasons. There is no virtue behind it. It's simply having a strong sense of duty and fulfilling that duty for the sake of fulfilling it. He himself does not even fully comprehend what he's fighting for anymore, or whom he made these promises to. He just keeps moving forward because that's the only thing left. It's pure stubbornness and following an incredibly vague ideal of commitment. Of course, the circumstances that led him here have a very tragic background, but his current actions and motives are not justified or put in a good light by the game story. It is seen full stop as a bad thing, which makes him an awesome villain to have to conclude the arc, because he is the literal opposite of the Warrior of Light when it comes to this very theme, since the Warrior of Light represents all the good aspects of conviction. Brilliantly written. Now, the next theme is probably familiar to anyone who has played Final Fantasy IX, as it was the primary theme of that game. That would be the theme of life and the importance slash value thereof. Since life is a pretty broad term, let me narrow it down here. I found Shadowbringers to portray this in two major ways. One is perspective. What life is, how this all depends on the viewpoint of the individual, it's basically a theme heavy in philosophy. 
Second is the actual value and importance of life. Since it's not the primary theme like in FF9, it's not quite as heavily featured in every single character in the main cast and most NPCs here, but it can still be seen in some characters as well as groups of characters. Let's use examples as that's always an easy way to explain your thought process. The two characters I would argue are the most intrinsic to this theme are Reen and Grahatia. A major part of Reen's character is how Minfilia gives Reen that choice to live her own life instead of taking over her body like she did to the last few incarnations, thus leading to her story of self-discovery and having the resolve to make her own choices in life. Grahatia, on the other hand, he is someone who was willing to sacrifice himself to save the world, or a world's plural I guess, while this can be seen as a virtuous thing, here in Shadowbringers they take a rather clear stance in saying that this is bad. I like this quote from Artburn. It's when you charge ahead trying to save someone else that you end up losing those you love. Now it's quite easy to misinterpret this quote. It's not actually saying to deliberately sacrifice people you do not care about to save those you love. Note the charge ahead part. He's basically saying that you shouldn't impulsively latch onto the first or easiest solution that comes to your mind to rescue people and be a hero. That is literally what Grahatia is doing. He wants to sacrifice himself to save everyone else, but what the story teaches us is that it's the wrong call to make, that there's no benefit to pointless sacrifice for the greater good. Rather, you should strive to find a solution where you get to keep those that you love while also saving as many as you can or even everyone. Because even that one life matters. No, especially that one life matters. And this is a major part of Grahatia's story. Him growing to appreciate life by not going for the sacrifice play and doing what he always wanted to do, to go on an adventure with the warrior of light. Another notable perspective into life is with the Fey folk. Unlike basically every single other character in this entire story, they do not live in the past or look to the future. They live solely in the present. This outlook on life is not that much different from very young children or dogs, and it offers a rather different perspective, which is utilized in a cool way, especially in one specific scene where Fel Ul implores the warrior of light to stop worrying about the future and just focus on the here and now, in the present. It gives us an alternative view on life, by saying that sometimes it's best to just enjoy the here and now. As with everything else I've discussed, there is also the other, darker side of the coin here, which would be with the society of Ilmore revolving around this very same idea but that one is obviously a more harmful way of doing it. In addition to this, you have the fact that the Amalja, Sahagin, Kobolds and Kikern are treated very differently here, and they function as basically normal respected citizens of the society, instead of the way they are shunned in the source, which serves to give us another perspective on life. I also appreciate how, after we are done with the first, one of the first things that happened is our relationships with the beast tribes are mended. It was done quite well. Finally, his team does tie into the villain and is once again the most obvious representation of this team, which is through Emmet Selk and how he does not view the fragmented individuals as people that are truly living. This is where the parallels with FF9 become quite apparent. The way in which Emmet Selk views the fragmented individual is basically identical to how Kuja views the black mages in 9. In addition, Emmet Selk's plan to sacrifice the remaining inhabitants of the source after enough rejoinings are done to bring back the ancients that sacrifice themselves is also a mirror of how the Terrans would use the genomes as basically vessels to take over once they would awaken. While the main conflict between the party and Emmet Selk comes from the primary team that we talked about earlier, this serves to bring a secondary type of conflict. And it's actually quite problematic, because I have seen people who think that this is not just the primary conflict, but also the only conflict with Emmet Selk. 
There's a particularly interesting line of dialogue where the writer sort of just let the players make up their own mind. Let us imagine that the laws of reality are again undone and the world faces true annihilation. Do you honestly believe that half your number would sacrifice themselves to save the other? Of course they wouldn't! Here we see Emmet Selk's perspective, but the party do not refute his point. What is interesting about this line is that there are two ways of interpreting it. Of course Emmet Selk would view the fact that his people sacrifice themselves so readily for the greater good in an entirely positive light. But when you stop to think about it, this is not necessarily the best solution, or even a good solution depending on how you look at it. Now, let's ignore the fact that this did indeed backfire as we know, because, you know, Heidelin and all that stuff happened. I just want to focus on this bit. It gives you a good perspective into the society of Amarod, how little they value individual lives. And this makes sense, given what their society represents. We'll get into that later. Point is, instead of trying to overcome these struggles, they opted for the solution that required immense loss of life which is basically the same deal as with Grahatia, just on a much larger scale and with much bigger consequences. Now, this is basically an expected outcome, given what we knew of the situation. It is nonetheless interesting to look at it from another perspective. Yes, the people of the current setting in FF14 wouldn't readily sacrifice half of their people, nor would we do it in the real world. But what you have to remember is that this can be seen as much if not more so as a good thing than it can be seen as a bad thing. Because it means people don't immediately give up, that they actually value life and they want to strive to preserve that life until the bitter end. But of course, there is no right or wrong answer to this and I am curious to know what you guys think. Which option would you have went for? Anyway, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that even though the game very obviously attacks Emmet Selk's viewpoint, it is an important thing because it should at least make you reflect on your own outlook on what life is and what it means, which is what this theme is all about. There are of course more themes that you can always look for. Themes of love, same as with the earlier themes, different portrayals thereof, and how it impacts characters on their journey. And indeed, love plays a big part in symbolism as well. The five light wardens that you face are named after the five notions of love as told by ancient Greek and can be seen as the journey that the warrior of light goes through and how it correlates to each important party member within that location where the light warden is slain. You also have themes of friendship and camaraderie. In fact, Shadowbringers makes a very big point in making everyone interconnected not just through the souls thing, but also by making everyone matter, even the regular people who aren't heroes. It's a game that puts great emphasis on the little people, so to speak, which I think is a callback to many other titles. FF3 in particular featured this idea heavily, I might add. It is the idea that people are here today precisely because they are connected to each other. However, the reason I'm not going more in length with these two sub themes or be mentioning more because I feel like going over more of them will be talking about stuff that I feel either didn't really have much impact in the grand scheme of things or they just aren't that interesting enough to discuss. There are always many interpretations on what themes a story tried to convey because it's all based on subjectivity and not 100% defined so you could go in circles regarding this topic for a very long time. Now there is one final theme I want to discuss, one that is very important which will be its own segment here. Let's talk about the actual world of the first. The Flood of Light came and indiscriminately destroyed all forms of life in its past. It nearly devoured the entire world and what little land remained became a ruinous world that refused to die. Never fully dead, but never alive either. Those who born into this world have no hope, no dreams, no future. For them, there is only a cycle, 
but not one of life. Those few that remain live under perpetual fear of the bringers of death, the sin eaters, and die in their struggle against them. Those who challenge the sin eaters get turned into sin eaters themselves, necessitating more dying in the fight against them. All living beings are souls of long dead ancients and people have to die for their sake. Even the governing power of the world is a sin eater whose sole purpose is to cause yet more suffering and death. Novrand is full of death. Only the Light Wardens are reborn and then only to bring more death. It is a cycle of death spiraling endlessly. That is short for me saying that Shadowbringers tells a dark story and it, in fact it's quite high up there for the series and that's saying a lot. They do not mess around. When I said at the beginning that not revealing basically anything about the expansion in 4.5 was a bit of a weird design choice, well we definitely see payoff here. Rarely have I seen such a strong introduction to a world. They nail it so perfectly with this ambient version of Tomorrow and Tomorrow playing in the background as you wander this strange land with the everlasting light that is as oppressing as it is depressing. You are sorta of given a warm welcome with the Crystarium as you find out a bit about the people of this world and the setting, but you are still harboring a lot of doubts towards the Crystal Exarch and what it is that you are doing here and the fate of the Scions. But aside from that, Shadowbringers doesn't hold back from kicking you in the nuts constantly at the beginning. Literally the first guy you meet dies within the first 10 minutes. Even the visit to the Crystarium is concluded with a broken, beaten down artwork telling you that the world is not worth saving and that it's had its fill of heroes. Then you go into Congusia and everything with the music the visuals, the dialogue depicts a setting where everything has gone wrong from a societal point of view. These settlements are incredibly small and shallow. People are struggling with their everyday life. One of the first quests you do has a villager tell you how just a single sin eater was able to slaughter nearly half of the entire village and how their mayor, her father, was then blamed for not asking for Ilmor's protection and the man hanged himself from the top of the tower due to all the guilt. Yeah, welcome to Shadowbringers. Oh, but we're not done. Then you get to find out what the city of final pleasures Ilmor is. It just emanates this aura of hiding so many twisted and messed up things inside it and the more you learn about the city, the worse it gets. Life is meager and full of hardships for the people down below as well as around Colusia, while the 1% indulge themselves while waiting for the world to end, their joy coming at the cost of the rest of the world suffering. The ones serving them getting murdered or fed to a sin either like an animal for making even the slightest of errors, meaning even those inside the city live in constant fear for their lives. Many enter, none leave. And yes, the city gets worse, oh so much worse. But moving on, you then go to Amarang and it just keeps getting worse still, as you find out just how terrifying the Sin Eaters really are, especially to common folk. My point is that even though in previous expansions we do see people suffer at different kinds of oppression and laws, the first is different. These people don't simply struggle because a big dragon god destroyed their homes and livelihood, or because a corrupt church is going around conducting murder on its citizens that they consider heretics, or because they are suffering from the constant oppression and stripping of their freedom at the hands of a tyrannical empire. These people struggle to even live to see the next day. Now instead of me going through the story events, let me simply put this into perspective. Let me give you the point of view of someone living in this world so that we can really understand just how awful of a place this is to live in. Say you are a person living in this world, it doesn't even really matter where for the purpose of this narration. You are afflicted with the corruption, the touch as they call it, and are in the process of turning. It's a common enough thing that happens, so you know that you pretty much have two choices. 
You either remain with your family and risk turning into a sin eater and slaughtering them, as well as having left this world as a miserable being whose existence will not be remembered, or you can abandon your entire family and go into exile to the edge of the world in a meringue to the inn at Journey's Head where people go to die. There you spend your final days, weeks, however long it is that you have left alone and reflecting on your life and your family. That is of course until you slowly lose more and more of your consciousness. You can't taste food, you can't smell anything or feel any kind of a touch. Memories of your parents, your friends and family slowly start to disappear and you will then be put down like a dog by one of the caretakers. Yes, in case you missed that, let me say that again. They have a go-to place whose sole reason for existing is to have people travel across the world for the sole purpose of dying. Also, you might say, what? I wouldn't have a family and kids. I'm only 25 years old. Or however old you are, that is actually the average age of my audience, I checked. But let me tell you something. You would not have the luxury of waiting until your 30s to get married. Oh no. This is never outright stated in the game, so I'm inferring here. However, it's quite a logical thing to assume. In a world like Norbrand, where people live in despair and under the constant fear of dying to a myriad of things that I will get to in just a moment, you would be spending every single second of your waking hours on surviving, on simply living to see the next day. And it has been this way for an entire century. In such a world, I wouldn't doubt that getting married at a very early age, at like 16 or 18, would be common spread. Because by the time you reach 30, it is probable that you will be dead. Hence, marrying and getting kids becomes less of a societal thing and more of a base instinct of mere survival. All of this is to say it puts it into perspective because no doubt you wouldn't want to get married and have kids in your 30s or whatever, but trust me, in this world you would. I also want you to think about how many old people you came across in the first. Yeah, it's not that many, is it? But let's propose an alternative scenario. Let us suppose that didn't happen. You didn't get afflicted and won't face a horrible death alone, far away from your loved ones. Let's say you are really lucky that you also didn't die by getting killed by a sin either directly. What then? The flood of light wiped away some of the most powerful and advanced nations in one fell swoop, and the time since then has been spent under constant struggle for survival. Now I want you to take a moment to stop and think about our world, our own history. Consider how much technology has advanced from 1920 until 2020. Yeah, it's a lot, right? How much do you think that technology has advanced in a world like this within the same time span? Pretty much zero, because there is no time or the resources for anything to advance. This means no improvements to transport, in fact most people literally travel by foot still, meaning your odds of getting mowed to death by a stray sin either while traveling is high. This means no medical advancement, so diseases would run rampant and kill people like flies, not to mention that any larger injuries that one can survive feasibly in real life in this world would probably lead to death. No advancements in military technology, not that there really is even a proper military in this world, barring the one that uses their military to cause further suffering, but what it means is there is no advancement in weaponry or protection or anything that would help you combat the Sin Eaters, whether that's on a larger scale such as airships, cannons, ships, artillery, or on a smaller scale such as simple infantry weaponry and protection. So your odds of becoming a capable fighter to defend you and those around you are extremely slim. And this is all without mentioning all the myriad ways of how advancement of technology could help you in your day-to-day -day life. Improve the architecture, improving the methods of travel such as through ships and airships. Well, there are airships, but we'll get into that later, but suffice it to say they would help you with the way they are utilized in this setting. Or ways of improving the dying ecosystem. Then we have the issue of agriculture being decimated and as we find out in Colusia, it keeps getting worse and worse as more people flock to Ilmore and more fields go unattended. So yes, 
Let's say that you are lucky and you won't get turned into a Sin Eater or directly die to a Sin Eater in one of their attacks. What are the odds then of you dying to a disease? Or starving to death? Or any other way that the world tries to kill you with? Let's suppose you manage to avoid all that and you somehow live into your late 30s or maybe even older. A miraculous feat, but there are a handful of old age NPCs in the game, so okay, sure, it happens. What does your life amount to? There are no inspirations in life for you to strive towards. No entertainment, no art, no hobbies, nothing. There is no time to think about that because your every moment living under the ever-oppressing sun of this world is spent thinking about merely surviving. Sure, you can pass on your genes and your memories onto the next generation, but what is it that they have to look forward to? More of this? Now, I don't mean to sound like an edgy teen being nihilistic. <laughs> well, maybe I do a little. But I am saying that this is the reality for these people. Because it is important to understand this from the perspective of the people living in the first for the next point I am about to bring up, since I will now finally talk about that theme I alluded to earlier. In a world like this, that has completely stagnated, and the society is so broken that it is beyond repair, there are only two ways for it to end. Either we keep going like this until the world snaps under the weight of its own degeneracy, thus leading to the eighth umbral calamity, or the cycle is broken by outside help. I love this because the writers make this incredibly apparent. We know that there is a doom timeline where the eighth umbral calamity happens, so we know with absolute certainty that the world is destined to fail without outside help. And we also see from our journey to the first how we start to slowly improve the world, both in a very apparent sense with restoring the night and everything that comes with that, but also by people's lives being affected. And this very thing is the theme that I wanted to talk about. It's hard to put into one or a few words, but essentially it's the idea of us bringing hope to this world and thus saving it. Because as we just established, hopefully you don't need more convincing still, the world is ruined and the societal structure has been irrevocably damaged and people's spirits are utterly broken. There can literally be no change within. We have gone way past that for it to be a possibility at this point. We, however, the Warrior of Light and the Scions, come from another environment and so are more optimistic and believe in a possible recovery of the world. We do get shaken by the state of the first, absolutely. But the amount we get shaken is nothing compared to the people that endured this for a hundred years. So we press on to take what steps we may and thus mark the road for those who would follow. Not to mention that we have the solution to the problem in a literal sense, by being able to deal with the Light Wardens. People in the first would never come to a solution. As far as they know, Sin Eaters are the punishment for and the incarnation of crimes they have committed. There's no need to know, so no one asks. You run or you fight. That is really all you can do. But even if the people in the first somehow miraculously found a solution on how to permanently kill a Light Warden, it would never happen because of the overwhelming force they would have to deal with in regards to Watery. This thing was rigged to be impossible to beat from the get-go. Now, when I say that we bring them hope, I don't necessarily mean that we fix all of this world's problems. Indeed, even after we leave the first in 5.3, although it spun up to be very much a happy conclusion to the world of the first, it could still be said that the world is still left broken. It's just that now people have the spirit to carry on and think about a potential future versus the state it was in when we first got there. I really like this theme because it's not this generic thing where we go from 0 to 100, where everything is completely fine and dandy in the end. We're not rolling up and completely fixing the world in a literal sense of us mending and healing it. No, the world is still very much fucked. But it is this glimmer of hope that we gave them that allows them to push the world just barely from the brink. Now, there is a thing with the Empty and the Eden questline, and I'll mention that in a bit. But in order for this to happen, there is a key piece in this puzzle, 
someone more important than Grahatia or the Scions or even the Warrior Flight. Someone absolutely crucial for this whole thing to work or all our efforts will have been for naught. That someone is... Yes, Reen. I don't think that many people stop to think about this, but Reen serves a much greater purpose to the plot than simply fulfilling her duties as the Oracle of Light, whether that's tending to people's light corruption or detecting light wardens. See, what makes her so important is that while the Warrior of Light, Grahatia, the Scions bring this outsider's perspective and help save the first, they are all only temporary solutions, band-aid fixes basically. That is where Reen comes into picture, because she is a resident of the first. She in a way acts as a mediator between us and the people of the first. We and Minfilia pass on the light of hope onto her, and it is then basically her duty and her responsibility to carry that onto the people of the first. If it's rough to fully grasp this point, don't worry, I can give an analogy which I think helps picture the situation better. Imagine for a second, if we take a corrupted location in real life, say North Korea, and we manage to fix it in a similar way, we bring outside influence to those broken people and lift their spirits, while we bring down the tyranny that perpetuates their suffering. But what do you suppose would happen if we then simply left them? They would either regress back to where they were before, or some other bad ideals are born due to how broken down people's spirits are and someone equally as bad is put in power again. You would only be temporarily fixing the situation. What you need is someone that is one of them to maintain the ideals that you yourself set up and make sure that people follow those ideals to build a better future. For those who like to study history, you probably know that this is what was often done with colonization. They didn't put some British or French cunt in power or to more appropriately tie it into this analogy, just leave them to govern themselves autonomically. What they did instead was instill their own values onto someone and put that guy in charge. Well, that is a very, very streamlined way of putting it and of course this is more of a negative case of this concept being used, but I hope I got the point across. We needed Reen to carry those values and ideals that we briefly showed so she can entrust them to these people and show them that these better values are an option to the people of Northrend. And this of course ties it into the primary theme as well since she is carrying on that legacy that we left. So it comes full circle in that sense as well. The game also took this a step further and, same as with the souls thing, demonstrated this in a very literal sense with Reen restoring life to the empty which then would start a very slow healing and recovery of the world in a more literal sense, and the fact that it will take dozens of generations for this recovery to come into play still goes in hand in hand with what I was speaking about earlier. While we are on this topic, I want to emphasize what Shadowbringers does really well, which is that it does something that the devs managed to nail in the past with the series, building a very dark and grim setting but balancing it out with having moments of comedy and lightheartedness. I've always loved games that can pull this off well, and Shadowbringers is definitely one of the most shining examples of doing so. Because if there weren't these upbeat moments to change the mood from time to time, the story in Shadowbringers would be so dark that it would be downright depressing to go through. Like, you wouldn't want to actually play it, that's how bad it would get, and I mean that sincerely. Another self-important little brat. Just what we need. <laughs> Reminds me of my childhood. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. It was a joke. Honestly, just a joke. But just now you called to me. On the topic of the world of the first, let's talk about flavor. This is something that is so crucial to making your audience actually care about the setting because without all this flavor and world building, everything becomes bare bones. You wouldn't eat a raw steak without anything added to it, would you? That is to say, something that is quite astounding is just how well they managed to make us fall in love with the first. Even we had zero prior knowledge on this world and its inhabitants. By the end, the first becomes basically a place you could call home as much as you would the source, or maybe even more so for some people. 
let's talk about some of these aspects that were done rather well. First, going back to the topic of the night sky that I briefly brought up earlier. As I said, this was an excellent case of integrating story into gameplay, but it also serves as a nice narrative device to give the players a very concrete quest throughout the story. In fact, you going around and restoring the night sky in each region is almost identical to the whole collecting the six crystals bit in Realm Reborn, a quest that was then repeated in Heaven's World. And I don't think this is a bad thing, mind you. On the contrary, I think having a clear goal throughout the game is exactly what you want. The same goes for the implementation of the Sin Eaters. I'll touch more upon the Sin Eaters when we talk about Watery, but they were basically meant to be just a punching bag sort of an enemy. They are pure evil, they cannot be reasoned with, and they exist simply as an enemy that must be defeated. This was to complement the actual villains of the story, the Ashians, who were written up to have a more sympathetic nature. Basically, you go through the game with a very clear quest in mind, fighting enemies that are unambiguously evil, and then that rug gets sorta of pulled from under you after you defeat innocence, as your motives and end goal become less clear and you go to fight an enemy that you actively learn about instead of something that is simply evil for the sake of being evil. What I also like about the Night Sky concept is that it opened up some interesting avenues to add in some more of that sweet flavor. When you restore the Night Sky within a certain region, there's some really awesome optional dialogue that opens up from basically every NPC. This dialogue includes a surprising amount of variety in different ways in which people respond to these events. Some might be worried about plants getting enough light. You've got people fanboying slash girling over the warrior of darkness. Some just enjoy the view. More people come to the infirmary because they tripping and hurting their knees. The Mord are making profits, selling light sources to people as lanterns and the like become high in demand. Then curse the light when it returns as they now have a ton of light sources that are useless. And once again rejoice when the night sky returns for good. You got people saying how much better they are sleeping because of course our circadian rhythm likes when we have a clear 24 hour cycle of night and daylight. Because beforehand all they could do to control their circadian rhythm was basically meal timings, which some NPCs also talk about. Then when the light returns after Mount Gulk, people struggle to sleep because of the sudden return of the night sky and just as they were starting to get used to it, the reversal back to the everlasting light really messed with their bodies. This then leads into issues like guards on patrol being more fatigued and cannot do their job as well, demand for concoctions that help with sleep becoming very high, and alchemists struggling to provide them and so on. This of course doesn't just apply to the sky changing, you also got a ton of interesting reactions to other events that happen. Ilmore, for example, has its citizens go through changes of dialogue like four or five times throughout the game. You have people being grateful to Reen for helping them out after the solo instance, different ways of people reacting to Votri and so on. One of my favorites is there's this one guy who's incredibly bitter towards you and the party because he was enjoying his lifestyle as a free citizen and you took that away from him and he essentially hates your guts and tells you to fuck off and he becomes more and more bitter as the game progresses. I like this a lot because it shows that obviously not everyone is going to agree with these changes and you will have people who don't want to adapt, which especially makes sense in this setting. Mind you, this is not just random dialogue that is disjointed. Most of the background NPCs have their own mini stories as the game progresses. You got this fangirl of Tancred who becomes increasingly more thirsty as the game progresses. There's this dude in Ilmore who is upset that his brother won't eat any meal. And then he laments on how much of a dumbass he was after he's discovered what meal really is. And how his brother is nagging him about it constantly. A guy in the Crystarium who becomes more and more obsessed with the shoe bill. You got this guy in Ford Job who is infatuated with Lena and tries his best to get her attention and hoping to go on a romantic Amaro ride with her and all this stuff but she's way too busy with her work as captain of the guard to notice. The man then notes how, despite him being unable to get her attention, he still nonetheless admires that particular trait about her. He then eventually goes to Tancred for advice on how to break the ice. Tancred then basically tells him, bro, just play some cards. And so after a certain point, he 
he actually becomes available as a triple triad NPC when he tries to learn how to play the game and also fittingly drops the Lina card. They also went above and beyond because it's not just within a single city that dialogue changes or whatever. After Mount Gulk, when the light returns, something like 70% of the dialogue changes across the world. It's not just a crustarium. You have people even as far as Fano commenting on it, even though the player has no reason to visit there. Or when Ilmor is liberated, it's not just Ilmor's dialogue that changes, but in Lakeland as well, with people reacting to Watery's true nature. Some look forward to the possibilities of trading with the most powerful nation in the world, while others are having doubts if the Ilmorans can adapt to a more hardworking society such as the Crystarium, and then later commend them when they do. You even find tidbits regarding what your own party members are up to at times. For example, if you visit Panov after Mount Gulg, the village leader tells you that Ushola came up looking for magic that can alter someone's elemental affinity, scouring the ruins and reading every tome she came across before finally asking for drawings of the murals before leaving, which is then brought up in the Tempest. Or Tancred telling people in the twine of what happened to you, well not literally the truth but the fact that you collapsed. Or after 5.0 the same village leader in Fanau mentions how Ushola came to thank them for the murals, or Alize who is chilling in the inn at Journey's head being hopeful that Harlick could recover and being flustered that you came to visit her. The first two examples are especially awesome because it really rewards players who go out of their way to look for this optional dialogue as it further emphasizes how much you matter to the Scions and how they were doing anything they can to help the situation while you were passed out. I could keep going with all these examples, <laughs> I wrote down all the optional dialogue based on environmental changes and there's pages worth of this stuff here, like I am quite literally only scratching the surface here. My point is that there's so many great cases of them utilizing optional dialogue and the attention to detail is just astounding with how they put this optional dialogue even in places where someone wouldn't realistically visit. Like how countless NPCs in every single location has dialogue changed after Mount Gulk, even though most players will simply press on to the Tempest and does not speak to these people. It's awesome because it makes the world feel so much more alive when you got these background NPCs who are inconsequential to the plot, having their own struggles to overcome in the background and seeing how they progress through the game and having direct feedback from all the major events that happen. Of course, did they do this in the past? Absolutely, but I feel like earlier on, a lot of the optional dialogue was more surface level, with way fewer changes over the course of the game, with less NPCs affected, without much continuity, and at times it was people literally just pointing out what you need to do to progress the story. Whereas in Shadowbringers there is a really strong focus put not just on the story, but also the people, these essentially nameless NPCs express themselves in very colorful and a wide variety of ways and yes, some of them even undergo actual character growth. Wow, if that ain't awesome then I don't know what is. And again, I'm not even talking about side quests, I refer to literally just background no-name NPCs. Another similar improvement I felt was with the side quests. I can't exactly pinpoint why, but they felt so much more high quality to me as compared to before. Like you were learning so much of the setting by doing them. I am not even talking about the role quests, though I do think the role quests were definitely an awesome addition as it ties them into the story much more directly than what we had in the past with job quests. I refer to the basic side quests that you do. The Ether current quest chains in particular were awesome in every zone and I highly recommend you to do them if you haven't already, because they continue past the quest that unlocks the Ether current. Same as with optional dialogue, it's quite rare, but some side quests do also reference the other party members. For example, there is this dwarf quest where this dwarf is trying to find some love, where this dwarf describes their ideal partner as being someone eerily similar to how Alfino described you to them. Again, this adds more to the feeling that your party members are doing things outside the MSQ. Something else they did to really flesh out the first were all these little methods to show how the first was a different place. Uh, this is pretty subtle, but if you pay attention, the alphabets slash the letters in the first are actually different from the source. In addition, you got things like the Fey language, or having the Amaro be basically the new Chocobo, 
or the fact that races have different names in the first, or how people in this setting have their own unique expressions that are very fitting to the setting and something you could definitely see people say in this world, like Wicked White, May the Shadows Keep You, uh, Calling Someone a Sinner, and so on. Beast tribes have a completely different societal role in here as there's no innate racism as was instigated in the source, so they play much more normal part in the society. History is explored to a great extent, especially in side content, and there's a great deal of mystery with how much civilization was lost. Some may think this stuff redundant, but I find it to be a rather crucial aspect of what made Shadowbringers as great as it was. A good plot and main cast can only take you so far if we are not at all invested in the world. And Shadowbringers, way more than any previous expansion, hinged immensely on you being invested in the world, which is why I think is the reason they went through such great lengths to ensure that we do. So we've talked about the world building more broadly, now let's get into the design of the specific cities and fields that are presented to us in the game. Something rather interesting with Shadowbringers is how they approach this. See, normally in RPGs, especially since we know that JRPGs in particular put much less emphasis on the open world and exploration aspect, cities are often built to be much more grandier in setting both in cinematics as well as how they are perceived by people of the world through their dialogue. So when you enter one of these cities, you have to use your imagination to realize that they are much more bustling with activities, there's much more architecture than what the player can necessarily see, and they should generally be a lot more populated to reflect on a more realistic amount of population for such a large city. This is very obvious when looking at all the past FF titles, but it's rather obviously seen in FF14 as well. Ishgard and Kugane are both way smaller than they are portrayed in the trailers and the like, and it's rather obvious that these huge cities have more than the, what, 100 or whatever NPCs we see in total? They should be in the thousands at bare minimum. So the basic idea is that the developers do the best they can to add as much flavor as they possibly could, but they still rely on the players using their imagination, and being able to perceive that, okay, there is more going on here than what I am literally seeing. That is, unless you write the story in a way such that the city shouldn't be bigger, more populous and vibrant than is shown in the game. And I feel like this is where Shadowbringers has a huge advantage. Because it is precisely that. Because the story of Northrend is that it's a location of a world decimated by the Flood of Light, and living here really sucks, and settlements don't really get to flourish as they do in the source or indeed in the real world, it's quite logical to assume that what we see portrayed in game is actually how the first really is. Maybe still not literally one to one, but close enough. And this greatly works to its advantage, not just for the immersion factor, but also because it's yet another way of putting the first into stark contrast with the source. For example, Ilmor is the mightiest nation in the world, yet it looks like a tiny fishing village compared to its source equivalent, Limsangominza. It helps sell the idea that this world is really messed up, and this could be applied to the entirety of the design behind Shadowbringers. It manages to be both small and big at the same time. Comparing it to the scope of the previous two expansions, one where you put an end to a thousand year war, and the other where you participate in what is basically the settings version of World War II, Shadowbringers does escalate from that quite nicely. The plot uses interdimensional time travel, you learn of literally the creation origins of the star, you gain full context on calamities, on Zodiac and Hydaelyn, on the Ashians, you discover the real meaning behind the primordial forces of light and darkness, all that fun stuff. But the scale of what you are actually doing in the game is quite small. You fight in a world that has been reduced to being incredibly tiny by comparison. There's no intricate amount of politics or dozens of nations involved. And the final act of the game isn't some epic battle on a grand scale like most finales in the source are. It's literally just you and your party traveling alone to face off Emmet Selk, who is also completely alone, albeit 
This battle has obviously a much heavier weight behind it than any previous encounter we've had. It's a bit hard to describe what I'm going for with here, but I guess I would say that they went in knowing that they can reveal about 80% of the world's mysteries and have a big setup to the expansion with traveling to an entirely different world that they could then afford to take a much smaller scale approach with the story itself and it paid off nicely I feel because in spite of that Shadowbringers has this weight and presence as a very important expansion because yeah it's where you learn so much of the world. The unique setup for Shadowbringers also allowed them to have the zones be incredibly varied and this on top of the dynamic element of the changes to the environment with the everlasting light slash night sky feature creates this feel that the world is constantly evolving and you just can't wait to see more and find out more. They also added the shared fate system, which I thought was a fun little extra thing to put in the zones. Obviously they didn't do anything spectacularly new when it comes to the design of the zones, and I've seen a few say in the past that Ava 14 should do more with its open world content. To be blunt with my opinion on that, I don't really care. I know it's an MMO, but at its core, FF14 is still a JRPG for me, and Japanese developers rarely put a huge emphasis on this stuff. I also don't genuinely feel like it did add much, if at all, to my enjoyment. We can certainly get into details of what I want to see in an RPG and which parts I find the most enjoying, but that's a bit too broad of a topic, so moving on. Another part that was brilliantly executed was the whole making the locations feel similar to the source, as it's a shard slash reflection, while also making them feel distinct. I am sure this must have been a great challenge for the developers, as it's a very fine line to reach that balance, but I think they did it rather well. Lastly, it goes without saying, but the design behind the zones both with the background as well as what's actually in them and the variety they offer is simply outstanding. So without further ado, let's get to talking about each of them. Since we talked about it just now, let's begin with Ilmore. Ilmore is obviously based off of Willbrand with a dark spin. The coastline itself is based off a location in the UK called the Seven Sisters. What I find interesting about Eomor is that they basically took four ideas that would have all been their own separate towns in other FF games and combined it into one. You have a town that appears all sunshine and rainbows from the outside, but holds some very dark secrets on the inside, as the more you get to know it, the more messed up it becomes. This can be seen in towns like Dali from FF9. The other thing is the stark disparity between the rich and the poor, where this difference is clearly shown with the same town. This is such a classic in the series, so I love that it makes its appearance here. Chidor slash Sozo in FF6, Midgar from 7, Reno in FF9 and of course Ishgard are good examples of a similar town. Finally, Ilmor represents the town slash city with the imperial power of the realm, who house the only airships in the world which also has a evil fiend slash god being planted as the one in charge of the city by the main villain. Yeah, that aspect was most definitely inspired by the kingdom of Baron in FF4, though you could also go for Gangemot from FF14, kinda. Oh, and it's also got an element of corrupted religion, which is a staple JRPG component right there alongside fake out character deaths and killing a god as the final boss. And this aspect is certainly in a few FF titles such as in Bevel from 10, many cities in Tactics or indeed Iskard in 14. So it's this sort of an amalgamation of different fantasy town designs and creates this place that is equally as oppressive, depressing and has this strong aura that something is turbo wrong here, that the more you find out the more you realize just how twisted this place is. Between the setup, the music, the way NPCs behave, even to things like how you cannot attune to the Etherite, which sends the player a message of you shouldn't return here, it captures that vibe brilliantly. As I mentioned earlier, Colusia in general gives you this feeling that, unlike most other locations, where not only does the place you feel like you're not welcome here at all, you really don't want to learn more about it because you know it's gonna get worse and worse, but you have to. 
they use these two awesome side characters, Chai Nuz and Dumia Chai, to basically represent Ilmor from their regular citizen's point of view. We see these two individuals, and they are not monsters. In fact, they show quite a lot of empathy, but they were basically poisoned, if you will, by this messed up society that Botri had set up. It's of course easy for us to say, oh, these people were terrible, they were enjoying a life of luxury at the cost of the suffering of countless others, but that's from an outsider's perspective looking in. How many of you, living in such a depressing world like the first, being honest with yourselves, would be enticed by the prospect of, instead of living your entire life struggling with the constant dread that you might not even live to see the next day, living like an animal where the only thing that occupies your mind is survival and survival only, you would instead have a chance, no matter how slim, that you can live your life with some kind of a purpose. You could make use of a particular skill you have to have a sense of purpose in a society that allows you to express your artistic and creative nature. Instead of everywhere else, where the most common expression is, oh, we didn't get slaughtered by Sin Eaters today or die to some other horrible thing, Let's hope the same applies to tomorrow. Of course people are gonna flock to a place like this. And I love the fact that even though there's an element of magic in play here, the game basically says, nah, this is not a magic issue, this is a humanity issue. And you have that incredible scene where Alfino gives his speech to the citizens of Ilmore after the solo instance, where he doesn't sugarcoat it and tells them how it is. And even though he goes in fully expecting them to not listen to a word he says, He's then shocked when the citizens of Ilmor volunteer to help the party out. This is then developed through the Mount Gulk arc as well as in post 5.0 MSQ. And what I like here is that they went for Ilmor having a very organic kind of growth. They could have easily just hand waved it with lazy writing like saying oh they were all mind controlled by Baltry and now everything is fine and dandy. Or it would have been so easy to just have the protagonist inspire them as the warrior of darkness and they go through a change. What instead happens is that writers put great emphasis on the Ilmoran standing up on their own two feet and build Ilmor by being proactive, which makes a lot of sense for this kind of a society where you have people with all sorts of skill sets. It's just that no one is certain of the future and in what direction to go. They understand that if there is going to be change, it has to start with the individual instead of looking for others to aspire to or to fix their problems. Ilmor undergoing this change is one of the definitive high points in the story in terms of okay, maybe this world isn't completely and utterly doomed because we see that even the most deeply rooted flaws of a society came, that came to be because of the state of this terrible world can be alleviated by giving them a little push. Now let's talk about airships. Yes, really, I have a paragraph dedicated to airships. I mean, I, I love the things like, what do you want from me? See, when I first saw that the Ilmorns had airships, my immediate reaction was one of confusion. If these dudes have airships, how can they struggle against the Sin Eaters at all? See, airships in the series are not used only as a way of empowering the players, but in many of the settings they also empower whichever nation has them. In Alpha 4, the Kingdom of Baron was going around conquering the world because they had airships. In 9, Lindblom manages to achieve peace after hundreds of years of warring because they had airships and the other nations were forced to agree to peace on their terms. Hell, even in FF14 itself, you see how devastating airships are when the Garlians clapped all of Dalmasca literally by just bombing the crap out of them with their airships. My point is that a nation having airships, when it decides to use it for warfare and not just for transport, is an absolute game changer because it is the equivalent of one nation having nukes while the other doesn't. In a fantasy setting that is based on a medieval setting, you just can't do shit if another nation has a weapon that can bombard you from the air with that much firepower, and it's game over. So the same would apply to the first. Why does Ilmor not just use airships? The obvious answer is, well, why would they combat Sin Eaters when Votri specifically wants to be buddies with them? What I mean is why do they not use airships to oppress the rest of the world? The attack on Lakeland would have been so much less effort if they did that. Just bomb the ever-living crap out of them and then send in the Sin Eaters to finish them off. They wouldn't be able to do anything. 
They could in theory retreat to the Crystarium where the elegant barrier prevents airships from entering, but then it would be only a matter of sending in some ground forces to disable it and then bombard the ever-living crap out of the city. Instead, they use airships as a glorified commercial. Hey, come join you more if you don't like dying. However, this isn't actually a plot hole. Quite the contrary, it's a very smart move by the riders. Because of course them not using airships makes sense because it reflects on Votri's mindset. When he came to power, he was so egotistical and certain of his Sin Eater solution that he didn't deem it necessary to start developing them for military use, rather just keep using them as transport airships as they were before the Flood. The game even acknowledges this point on two occasions. One is with optional dialogue. The second is when the party is thinking of ideas to enter Mount Gulg, where I believe Alfino brings up the idea of arming Eomor's airships, but the option being unrealistic slash not attainable due to a lack of someone with the know-how like Sid. I also just want to mention that the fat Mikote thing is kind of funny at first, but when you consider that becoming fat is not an issue in this world due to people literally not having enough food to become fat in the first place, it really puts Ilmore into perspective. Speaking of something funny and getting to the next topic, the dwarves. Dwarves are awesome. I know some people didn't really like what they did with turning Lalafels of the first into dwarves, but honestly I found that to be a very cool and interesting concept, even if it was to save resources. I was playing a Lalafell around the time of the lead up to the expansion and I was thinking of going to a different race to play the MSQ, but when they announced Dwarves I was so stoked I even renamed my character the Dwarf King and enjoyed quite a bit of role playing as a Dwarf in Shadowbringers. I mean seriously, who doesn't like Dwarves? I think this was a long time coming, finally a Final Fantasy title with Dwarves. The last one was what, FF9? That game came out 20 years ago. It also comes with all the good shit like Lali slash Rally Ho, dwarves totally being the best engineers especially when it comes to explosives, you got tanks and funny dialogue. Yeah, I'm just gonna say, the dwarves in this game are hilarious. Is it cheesy? Sure, but it's also great and funny. I also love their whole everlasting hatred between the two tribes over what seems to be on the surface the dumbest of things. But then you find out that there's more to it and how that's a callback to the war over cheese with the goblins in the source. I mean the dwarves here essentially fill the role of the goblins in almost every way and that's not a bad thing. They also get one of the best ever beast tribe storylines. Please go do it if you have not yet done so. In addition to an awesome storyline you get to build a tank that you get to use as a mount. I mean I don't know what more I can do to entice you. Also, these two are definitely the reflections of Sid and Nero. However, they didn't just stop there. On top of being really entertaining, they actually did give the dwarves quite a bit of backstory and we find out in some side quests some more tragic parts of their society, which I will talk about when we cover the side content of Shadowbringers. I won't discuss Mount Gulg or the Innocence fight here because I speak about it in another segment. Naturally, we should then talk about the other major city and a foil to Ilmor, the Crystarium. They did such a wonderful job of displaying the stark contrast between these two cities. Whereas all the aspects in Ilmor, including the team, gives the player that feeling they're not welcomed in there, Crystarium's design and main team goes for a total opposite approach. The team is vibrant, full of hope, inspiration, it sounds almost like a national anthem and it makes you feel proud to be a citizen of this great city. It could also be said that Ilmor represents all the values that we hate to see in our society, while Crystarium presents all the values that we consider of being a mark of virtue. Ilmor is deceptive in that the leader manipulates its citizens to think they are doing everything for their own good, when in reality they are simply driving their own agenda. They have an oppressive, militaristic nature and a totalitarian approach to resolving all conflicts. 
there's this stark disparity between the rich and the poor, where 1% live in luxury off of the back of the remaining 99% suffering. You have a religion set in place to further harm the citizens, and it puts more effort on looking better on the outside than it actually does on the inside. Crustarium, on the other hand, shows us a society with a strong leader who truly believes in their people. They use their military for its bare-bones minimal purpose, which is to basically guard the citizenry from beasts, and their society is shaped after flawless egalitarianism, where everyone has equal rights regardless of background, each person plays a role and everyone works and earns for the betterment of everyone else. Now, if that sounds a bit too ideal for you, even by fantasy standards, then I think it has pretty much achieved its purpose. Let me explain the narrative reasons behind the Crystarium. Number one, it's got something to do with the point I brought up earlier about how you need to balance dark aspects of your story with something less doom and gloom. The Crystarium is exactly that. We are introduced to this city as a way to soften the blow on just how horrible the world is as we find out in Colusia and Amarang. It also serves to show us just how bad off the first would have been if it was not for Graha's intervention, thanks to the inheritors of Ironworks. Because can you imagine how much more awful the first would have been if, it not, if not for the Crystarium? In addition to this, on a more macroscopic level, both the Crystarium and Ilmor serve as narrative tools to show us what those two characters, Gratia and Vothri, are like, and the contrast between them. The contrast between someone who came from a world that had hope versus someone who was born into a world that knew only despair. Plus, the Crystarium is an extension of Graha's storyline and that whole idea of the Crystal Tower being a beacon of hope for mankind, which we arguably see actually realized for the first time in Shadowbringers. And finally, there's still a logical reason grounded in logic as to why the Crystarium is such an ideal city. It's because it was deliberately built that way from the get-go by Grahatia. Think about it. A giant crystallized tower appears out of thin air and you have this man who acts as a representative. People from nearby slowly flock over to this place and start building around it. Why? Because it acts as that beacon of hope I just talked about. It's a great source of inspiration, motivation and hope at best, and something to distract them from the dread of everyday life at worst. People then aspire to create a community around it, and Grahatia, who has the outsider's perspective and a more idealistic slash hopeful outlook in believing this world is worth saving, shepherds them over the course of many decades. Of course a nation like this, born from such an environment, would be one that actually works. There are no selfish individuals or thieves or people wanting to abuse the system, because these people have been engineered, from a societal point of view, to behave in this way. In other words, the Crystarium is a result of a very exceptional set of circumstances, whereby it only works because people were at their worst and were given an opportunity to do better. It honestly sounds pretty harsh when I put it that way, but I suppose that's just human nature. I guess that's why the game doesn't really explore this particular aspect as it would really detract from the theme that the Crystarium is going for. Another thing to mention is that the Crystarium is not appealing. We see that the overwhelming majority of people in the first prefer Ilmor. And yeah, this makes perfect sense due to how I described Ilmor earlier. It makes itself sound so much more appealing on the surface than the Crystarium does. This interplay between the Crystarium and Ilmor, Grahatia and Botri is definitely one of the best aspects of the story. Plus, just from a sheer artistic point of view, this place is absolutely stunning. What a way to fire off the expansion. And that callback to the original 2005 early version of FF14. Since I'll be discussing home minster suites elsewhere, let's talk about the dungeon featured inside the Crystal Tower, the Twinning. My god, what a dungeon and what a cool way to tie up the story behind the Crystal Tower, Alexander and Omega. Also, I have a theory. Since this is a dungeon about what happened in the bad timeline, and it prominently features FF13 enemies, I wonder if this is a meta commentary by the developers that FF13 was a mistake that belongs only in a bad timeline? 
<laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. I actually like F13, so please don't come after me if you are a fan of that game. And do I even need to say anything about the BGM? How did the man combine three incredible songs into one absolute banger of a tune? Perhaps we'll never know. Speaking about Lakeland in general, I absolutely adore what the artists did with this place. See, this was to be the mirrored version of Mordona, right? So they took an iconic feature from Mordona, well, besides the Crystal Tower, which is the purple sky. But the first is covered in everlasting light, so they couldn't do that. So what did they do? They turned this idea on its head, quite literally. They made the ground level be all purple instead with the foliage and managed to convey the similarity in that way. Absolutely brilliant. Lakeland is also very rich in having so many interesting places. You got the ruined castle of the former Elven Kingdom called Laxton Loft. You have the source, interesting name choice by the way, which is this large lake, obviously they're the mirrors like silver tier. You've got nearby small villages like Hallminster Switch, an outpost named after a hero who gave his life to defend everyone else from a Sin Eater onslaught. One of the many churches that were built all over Lakeland by the Church of the First Light, a church that is said to have been the peak of ingenuity and architectural prowess. Oh, and there's also this pixie, who is also an island, who is also a whale, who can also swim, who can banish incredibly large bodies of water with an airy sphere. Oh, and who can also fly. Just in case you needed reminding that Shadowbringers likes to feature a lot of highly fantastical elements into its story. Speaking of which... Yilmeg was the zone that probably blew me away the most. Well, until the Tempest, of course. Now, this is something I have failed to mention thus far, and it's because I felt this would be the best place to talk about it. Since the setting of Shadowbringers allowed the riders much more liberty in terms of world building and the narrative they want to tell, one of the things they wanted to do is tone down the political intrigue that, the, that was there in the previous two expansions, and focus a bit more on telling an epic fantasy tale. Don't get me wrong, there are still politics in play in Shadowbringers. The whole dynamic between Ilmore and the Crystarium that I just talked about is a huge part of the story. The best way I can describe it is that in Shadowbringers they wanted to push magical slash fantastical elements a little more to the forefront, and this can especially be seen in zone designs like Ilmeg, Raktika, and of course the Tempest. Just these really wacky ideas like I just talked about with Bismarck, which by the way wasn't originally how you were supposed to go to the Tempest, but there was an artist with a very wild imagination and they thought it'd be a fun idea to go for. Anyway, so Ilmeg, aka the Rainbow Kingdom, right? This zone is kind of funny because it's almost like a wacky side quest sort of a deal you might see in a D&D campaign. The party gets in a tough spot, and it somehow results in them ending up in the Feywild, and now they gotta deal with these pixies and god knows what else messing with them, while they are on this quest to obtain four of these magical items to complete that section of the campaign. And it's true, Ilmeg is the only zone in all of Shadowbringers MSQ that you never return to after you restore the night sky, until the very final scenes of 5.3, when you go to speak to Ruyanje and Sedo, but I think that's what makes it work so wonderfully. It's a distraction from all this other stuff you have to deal with in Shadowbringers and allows the story to just kind of go wild with ideas. For example, you do not meet a single new human person in all of Ilmeg, well, besides Rianje, I suppose. They are all magical creatures, and what I like is that they made it really varied. It's not just the pixies. You also got the Fuath, the Numo and their Porxies, and the Amaro. This is probably the single most varied zone in the game when it comes to having different and unique types of cultures in it, and I think that is a big reason I absolutely fell in love with this zone and really took my time going through it, because I kept wanting to find out more about each of these magical races. The backdrop is also intriguing, 
You got this great kingdom that fell as a result of the flood and the sin eaters and the Fey being forced to flee from their prior home because of the aforementioned issue arrived there and started to shape the land in a magical way. So there's this nice mix of fallen civilizations, fantastical elements and themes of nature all rolled into one zone. It's also great how they had this act as a mirrored image of Quartus before the seventh Umbral Calamity, which works out rather well as most players never got to play 1.0. I should also mention, just because you don't revisit Ilmeg doesn't mean it doesn't have a strong purpose in the narrative, besides the obvious world building. Not only do you regularly interact with Feo Ung, who helps you out in a multitude of occasions, but each of the type of races in Ilmeg also get to play a prominent character in the story. Feo Ung, Beg Lug, and Sedo, meaning they aren't just one and done. Well, everyone with the exception of the Fuath, but no one likes those bastards anyway. The Fae Folk also bring an interesting perspective to the story, thematically speaking. Like I discussed earlier, the Fae are like small children or dogs, whichever comparison you want to go for since, you know, Numo. They merely live in the present, and so don't overly concern themselves with what things are like long term. There's an amazing scene after you defeat Innocence, when the story is at its lowest and Fae Ul tells the warrior flight to stop worrying so much, to stay very still and think of the here and now. I know I already referenced this scene earlier, but I really like this message because it is so highly relatable. So often, we tend to worry way too much about the future, when the healthy answer might be to simply enjoy the present. Also, while on the surface, this zone seems to be all sunshine and rainbows, yes pun intended, the more you get to know, the more you realize, Oh yeah, I am playing Shadowbringers, everything is awful and we can't have fun for two seconds. The Fuath are born from the souls of the drowned and so, out of bitterness and because they find it funny, they lure people and even other fey folk into drowning and thus joining them. And as many of you are no doubt aware, drowning is one of the worst ways to go that you could think of. The Amaro, which I drew similarities to the auspices in the source in an earlier video, are beings engineered to rely on a master, but they now walk without their masters and are basically really depressed over that fact. So they just sort of chose Ilmeg as a place to share the pain with other Amaro and live out their last days there. Similarly, the Numo used to rely on people as well. They traded with the people of Wobird, and their culture heavily revolves around trading things, not in an economic sense, but more out of principle. You know, giving something, then receiving something in return. The sad thing is that they could actually return to this lifestyle, and we do see how they spark with so much joy when they do. I love how they have even a bit of gameplay bleed into the story, because you unlock the Numo vendors by completing tasks for them instead of them simply being unlocked outright. But the problem is that the Pixies and the Fuath keep killing everyone, entering Ilmeg so they rarely if ever reach the Numo. And finally, we have the Pixies. Spirits of deceased children who died way too young. You would never expect it, but the Pixies get probably the most tragic Beast Tribe storyline. And I like how the storyline emphasizes how it's okay to be different. It's a very wholesome questline, so once again, I highly recommend doing it if you haven't done so already. Plus, it directly ties into events of the MSQ as it deals with what happened after you defeated Titania. Oh, the way the Pixies dies also... Well, they simply fall asleep and never wake up, so... That's wonderful. And by wonderful, I of course mean depressing. Ilmeg also has a pretty dark aspect to it as a zone when you realize that these playful pixies are murdering people in the most horrible ways because they lack empathy due to being children in spirit. It's staying true to the source material, which is of course the pixies in myth, but it fits so well with Shadowbringers and with that design I talked about, where you have lightheartedness to balance out the story being so dark. Also, when you do the Pixie Beast Tribe quests, you find out this pretty wholesome thing where the Pixies and the people do share a connection, via the Pixies essentially being responsible for people seeing happier dreams. It really makes you think just how terrible of a place the first is, when you realize that people 
probably do not see that many pleasant dreams because there is hardly anything happy that goes on in their lives. So you got these pixies that bring a little bit of light into the world. Pretty neat. Don, Meg and the Titania boss fight were both amazing and further sold the cool atmosphere that they were going for with this zone. Titania is interesting because it's pretty refreshing that you don't fight a primal as you always did, but they still kind of manage to capture those feelings of familiarity with how she's essentially a fusion of all the nature elements and uses those elemental attacks throughout the fight. So she's sort of like a nature themed primal without actually being a primal. The song, of course, very fitting to the playful nature of the pixies, and her lines are absolutely hilarious. It's a weird feeling fight because it's obviously very lighthearted, yet the story behind Titania is actually quite heavy and tragic. But they do explore that element in optional dialogue as well as the pixie beast tribe quests. Very well made boss with how much it can give such conflicting vibes. Plus there's something that I absolutely loved about Feo'ul becoming the new Titania. I think that really helped cement Feo'ul as an awesome character. Not that they wouldn't have been great otherwise, but you know. Also, it goes without saying that this zone is breathtaking when it comes to visuals, both the zone itself and Lee Meg. You can simply tell that the artist put in so much effort into making it stand out, and of course the music, it all comes together to make this environment ooze atmosphere. It pretty much single-handedly puts the word fantasy back into Final Fantasy. Raktika serves as a reference to the Twelve's Wood and Jelmora in the Source as a reference to Twelve's Salika Wood and is inspired by Mesoamerican culture and this zone definitely had one of the strongest first impressions. The moment you enter you are overwhelmed with this aura of there being this ancient historical significance to this place which then of course makes you think of Ishtola and her desire to discover the truths behind this star. From a world building standpoint, it also shines, pardon the pun. First of all, the light isn't as pervasive here, due to the giant trees obscuring it slightly. The Knights Blessed are an interesting faction, taking solace in the darkness and believing that past reverence to light was what brought about their current predicament. And indeed, getting to explore this place is such an experience. Well, not counting that we start off by being told that a child was slaughtered by a sin eater and we need to retrieve their item of symbolic significance, that there's a radical faction that uses poison and venomous spider to inflict some really agonizing pain on everyone who doesn't buy into their extreme cult, and of course ancient temple ruins that try to kill you at every turn like you are in an Indiana Jones movie. The whole thing about the world being small probably applies the best to Raktika. We do know that the forest is a lot bigger, but there is only this one small section that is habitable. The bees tell us that there used to be a ton of camps like Fanov, but this is the only one that remains, and that their numbers have been dwindling over time. It really helps put into perspective just how bad things have been getting, that even these fierce warriors that have been around since long before the Ronken Empire have been reduced to what we see in the game. One tiny village with only a handful of them left. Now, say what you want about the way the different races were designed, but one thing I must give them props for is that they made an amazing use of them in the expansion. They are both really tied to certain storylines and there's a wealth of information that you get to learn about them. And we'll get to the Rodgar way later, but you learn so much of the culture of the Vs and the side quests in Fanov are some of the best in the game. This is definitely the way to introduce a new race. You put in a ton of lore that is explored in the story itself within the same expansion that the race is released in. A big reason for why it's so well developed is because they had a helping hand from Mr. Matsuno himself for creating the lore surrounding the Viera slash Vs. So let's talk about Ronka. This is obviously meant to be a sort of a mirror of the elegant empire. In fact, Ushtola even notes some similar techniques used to suppress the natural flow of either similar to the elegant pillars in the House of the Crooked Coin, but I like that the game leaves it ambiguous whether or not the Ronkens were like how most empires tend to be, oppressive, ambitious in their war efforts and forcefully assimilating other cultures and abusing those they capture. 
or if they were a more benevolent and kind empire. They then take this idea a step further and incorporate it as an actual decision that the player can make. I think some were put off by it, but I found it to be a refreshing change from how these sort of events normally go. The player is given vague hints about the empire and they can then form if they want to go for a more pessimistic or optimistic point of view. What also sells Ronka is that we not only get two instances and a dungeon, all of which are really cool, but they don't simply tell us, oh look at this ancient empire who had all this knowledge, rather they actually show it. Two of the really major reveals come to us in association with Ronka. First, with the murals that depict the final days and the Heidelin kick, but also in 5.2 in regards to the Echo. Yes, both times there's a character filling in some details, but that's fine I would say. And there is something that does confuse me a bit though, which is tying it in with Ronka. See, when I saw this at the fanfest, I thought this is where we will get our airship. Because for those of you who recall, in FF5, the Ronka or Lonka, depending on which translation you prefer, were a civilization with quite advanced technology, featuring impressive architecture, like a flying sky fortress, and it's through the Ronka ruins that the player obtains the airship. So when I actually played this area in the game, I was like, huh, that doesn't make much sense. Why Ronka? Why not choose something like the Sentra from F8? You know, powerful sorcerers and all that fun stuff. But then I realized it's probably not a reference to Five, but rather to the Ronken Empire or Ronken Dynasty, again depending on which translation you prefer, from Tactics. Not much is told of the Ronkens in Tactics, but I can only presume that this name came to be chosen after the plot point of Ushtola using Matoya's name and her becoming a Tomaturge was conceived, hence Court Tomaturge Matoya from Ronka. <laughs> Man. The FF14 devs really know their Final Fantasy Tactics lore. Finally, it's worth noting that this zone had been responsible for some really great memes, and it really shows how the developers were able to adapt on the fly and roll with it. Hey, is that something that you can only do in an MMO? I think it is. Basically, I refer to how Mr. Sokin created the team, and he just put in some non-coherent gibberish, but when people catched on to the whole Lahi thing, not only did we have the man himself call the song Lahi, but also the developers incorporated into an actual thing in the setting with the addition of the Kitari Beast Tribe. How awesome is that? I also can't talk about Raktika without mentioning the one and only, the legendary serpent of Ronka. Again, going back to the whole thing about having new developers having some involvement, this was a pet project made by a new member on the dev team and it just quickly became everyone's favorite. And it might be a bit hard to understand why, but I think it was simply with just how wacky, cheesy, ridiculous and out there that side quest chain was, and it was awesome. It really is a testament to the thing I talked about how much better side quests got in Shadowbringers. And same as with Lahi, once the developers noticed that the fans were loving this obscure side quest way more than they had ever intended, they then featured the Serpent of Ronka more heavily in the Kitari Beast Tribe quests, where these Ronka serpents help you along the way, all with cute adornments like a miner's helmet and a cowboy hat. And you even get the thing as a mount. It's basically become the first equivalent of Namazu, which is funny because that too gets referenced in the Kitari Beast Tribe. So please, Square Enix, whoever worked on the Serpent of Ronka questline, let them feature more prominently inside quests in Endwalker, because she did such an awesome job here. He told me Armorang meant majestic land in the language of his people. And so it might still be, were it not for the Light's unrelenting onslaught. Okay, so Amarang is the zone I have probably the least to talk about, although that's not necessarily a bad thing, because what the zone was meant to do, it does it and does a terrific job at it. Amarang, like Colusia, is meant to immediately show you just what kind of a world you've entered, but it does it slightly differently from Colusia. 
Whereas Kongusia is the type of a thing where it's wrong and you know it's wrong, but it still tries to be deceiving. In Amarang, everything is laid bare. We see a great nation buried within the sand. We see the flood of lights encroaching presence as we stand at the edge of the world. And the music tops it all off to give us a very melancholic vibe, a vision into a dying world. It gives such a strong first impression that one cannot help but to stop and take it all in for a minute. This zone also retains the saddest undertone even after you restore the night sky. It's hard to describe but you feel this sort of a calm yet saddening presence permeate throughout the zone, especially with the night team. Perhaps it's a team to represent all the people that have come here to meet their end, and of the civilizations lost to the flood of light. That even after you restore the night sky, the people that came here to be eternized are still buried in the sand, and the night team has the sad undertone to remind you of that fact. Sands of Blood is a very fitting name indeed. Besides that, the whole concept of it being the place where people come to die was an interesting idea. Horrifying, but interesting. I like the parallel to Uda through the mining business, but with a really cool spin with the Talos. I also love how the developers actually went to Saudi Arabia to take pictures and film the desert there and use that to design Amarang. The more were also a great addition and kept this zone from being too depressing. I should mention that this zone too features some awesome side quests. I love that one where you can choose to smash the bottle before the guy, or the one where you gotta find the right place by using clues given to you, and of course, the Aether current storyline. Malik as well. Not much to say, this dungeon probably did the least for me out of all the 5.0 dungeons, but it's not bad, it's just the one that stands out the least. I think it's intentionally a bit less energetic because of how emotional the story got just before you reach that dungeon, so it has these pretty chill vibes to allow you to reflect on those events you just witnessed, and that fits with the overall Amarang aesthetic as well. I do love how the last boss is a representation of family and love, makes the whole story arc in Amarang come full circle. Ah oh man, the Tempest. Where to even begin? This is the final zone of Shadowbringers and highly praised by basically anyone who ever played this game. In fact, I am sure if I ask everyone watching this their favorite zone, minimum 9 out of 10 would say it's the Tempest. And I would agree, it's a phenomenal area. I love that unlike the previous two final areas that featured big battles and a health and expansion of buildup, the Tempest sort of just happens. It's not some heroic final push or an epic event. You simply go in there alone, just you and your party, with the ever-looming threat of your corruption as well as Grahatia's well-being hanging in the air, while you basically have no idea of what's going to happen or how things are going to play out. You are at the bottom of this ocean where everything is dark and the only interaction you have are the Ondo, and the stories they share about these ruins. The light does not reach these depths, but you feel cold and isolated, all the while you are pressured by the circumstances of the warrior flight and Grahatia. The atmosphere is just fantastic, and I love all the neat details. The sound of waves in the background, the interesting water effects on rocky surfaces and the like, that indicate how this place had the water sucked out in a sudden and unnatural manner. You see clouds moving past the water surface and so on. The Ondo, while they seem boring at a first glance by being just the Sahagin, there's actually a lot of interesting side quests with them and they have a rather intriguing story to them. But what really makes this place so memorable is of course the fact that they split this into two parts. They wanted the final zone to be really memorable and so they put in a lot of effort into adding this entirely second component to it, with its own BGM, own team and design everything. It's basically having two zones interwoven into one and they put it off so damn well. So you start on this somewhat dark seafloor area with the Ondo slash Sahagin surrounded by ruins, and then you slowly progress and delve deeper until you come across an ancient city. Bye. 
By the gods. I did not think they meant an actual city. Then we are seeing the same view. The remnants in the Ondo settlement were solid material structures. But these. Everything here pulses with ether. Tis an enchantment on a monumental scale. I mean, how many of you remember the first time you saw this city? The somber tone of the song, the constantly ticking clock in the soundtrack, the design of a majestic illuminated cityscape made of stone, the otherworldly feel of the citizens, the feel of an entire world where time stands still, the sound of the waves in the music I could keep going. All the details make what is arguably one of the most iconic cities in the entire series. I hate to use this word because it's so overused, but I would definitely describe Amarot as a masterpiece. A true testament to how video games are more than capable to qualify as art. Everything, from the lead up to the sound design to the visuals to how it all ties with the story and its villain thematically, it all comes together to create an experience that I have not felt in a very long time. A final dungeon slash area that isn't just good, but truly memorable. First, let's talk about the tone. Beautiful and poignant. This is what the developers wanted to go for when it came to tone. It creates such a wonderful contrast with the rest of the game because there is no hype or victory moments here. It's designed to make you slow down and reflect, to invoke thoughts. This sort of a slower pace for the final area is interesting because they never done it before in FF14, but it works because of the nature of the villain. Emmet Selk was designed to be a much more sympathetic villain than what we have seen before, and so it was a brilliant decision to make the final area and dungeon focus entirely on his story and show his personality. It reminded me of dungeons like Kefka's Tower and Ultimisia's Castle, both of which stand out to me as final dungeons because they are themed after the personality of the villain. It's the same thing here with Amaroth. What I mean is that Amarot isn't just the place where the final battle takes place in, like was the case with Azuzla and Alamigo, rather it's intimately tied to Emmet Selk in that it can be seen as an extension of his personality. The fact that he created an illusion of an entire city and did so while being rather meticulous with the details tells us, without needing a single word of dialogue, that he desperately misses his people and the way life used to be. It paints a picture, bright as day, of a man who lives in the past and of a man who carries a burden of an entire civilization, a massive burden that no man should ever have to bear alone. For those of you who have played the Persona games, it's a bit like that, where the dungeons you enter are based off of a character's own worldview. It's not as literal in this sense, of course, you aren't literally entering Emmet Selk's mind, but it's a very strong indication of his mentality and this was a big part of why the last area was so effective. The ticking clock was such a fantastic addition because it adds so much depth to the atmosphere, because it can be interpreted in different ways depending on how the player is feeling at that moment. You could perceive it as thematic to how the people in Amarod are stuck in a time bubble, where time is essentially frozen. You could think of it being tied to the warrior flight and how they don't seemingly have much time left until they give in to the corruption, or likewise the urgency to rescue Gratia. 
Or you could perceive it as the time running out too soon for the ancients. You know, tomorrow's come too soon. Even though the last one is most likely the intended message. I like that there's multiple angles of looking at it. And it just depends on the player's emotions and how they view it at the time. The sound of waves in the song that indicate how the song of the ancients went dead underwater as they are forever forgotten by the rest of the world. So the idea here is, whereas the Crystarium was a city based on something that many would want our current society be turned into, as it's shaped after an egalitarian model, on the surface, Amaroth may seem somewhat similar, but they are actually inspired by a different thing entirely. Whereas the values set by the Crystarium are idealistic values, they are still grounded in reality. It is what we imagine that our society could look like, even if it would be incredibly hard indeed, some would say impossible, to execute in practice. It is nonetheless a possibility on paper. Amarod, on the other hand, is based on pure fantasy. It's a heaven, a paradise, an utopia, whatever you want to call it. It's not grounded at all in reality, rather it features elements on what most people would consider an actual perfect 100% flawless society, something that most understand and accept is literally impossible to achieve. It probably then doesn't come as a surprise to hear that Amaroth was inspired by author Sir Thomas More, whose most famous book is one that many of you are probably aware of called Utopia. This is apparent in the names of some of the locations and characters, but more importantly with the setup. Same as how Thomas More separated the island of Utopia from the rest of the world, thus allowing him to explore it fully detached from any real-life references and give the world its unique norms and edicts, so too did the writers for Shadowbringers utilize Amaroth in the same way. Another utopian-based work that served as inspiration was another fictional island, which was of course Atlantis which can be seen in the visual design of Amaroth, mainly in reference to the water theme and everything being made out of stone. I should also mention that Utopia itself derives from Greek philosophy, specifically that of Plato, and indeed Platonism being about examining the difference between concept and reality is very much represented with Amaroth through the whole creation magics idea. Look, I'm not gonna lie, you could make an entire video about this topic, what inspired them and going more in detail, but I will have to exercise restraint here. But while these works served as an inspiration, what truly makes Amaroth stand out are the magical elements that they applied to it, and the way it was woven into the narrative. So first, let's talk about the magical aspects. I love how the writers are able to convey this theme so crystal clear, they made citizens large, which immediately puts the player in a position where they can feel how insignificant and inferior they are compared to these people. I love especially that scene with Hutlo, where you have to climb this giant wall that is in fact just a basic chair for them. This is then combined with their language that we literally cannot even comprehend. Note that this isn't the same deal as with the language of the dragons. The dragon's language is basically a more efficient version of English. At first hearing, it sounds like it's just random words, but one can, in fact, through extensive research and pattern recognition, translate the language. With the language of the ancients, they did something brilliant in that the language is just a bunch of gibberish. In fact, it's not even something we can count as a language from a linguistic point of view because there are no clear sounds that would connect in a logical way to make up a language. It's quite literally random noise, even if it was recorded by a person making those sounds in a studio. Then you also have how the ancients are able to create basically anything with their creation magics. This is brilliant since it gives them something that we lack, not just in the universe, but in the real world, to sell the idea of just how alien these citizens are. In fact, the ability to do this is comparable to something akin to the ability to speak, or consciousness in general, which then allows the player to very easily and clearly understand why it is that Emmet Selk doesn't consider the post-Zodiac life forms or fragmented beings as being truly alive. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Point is that all of this very clearly communicates to the player that this city, this civilization, is far beyond their comprehension and even makes you feel somewhat uncomfortable, if that makes sense. 
There is a theme that is often portrayed in works inspired by Moore's utopia concept, which is the idea that an utopian society should aspire for collectivism and shun individualism at all costs. With the exception of Heitlodeus, who is kind of a special case anyway, there isn't a single named NPC in this entire city. They are simply described by adjectives and referred to as Amarotines. Even the Convocation of Fourteen, who are also inspired by Moore's book in that they are individuals chosen by a group to represent the particular vision for their society, are not named and are simply referred to by their title. Furthermore, magic is once again used to take this idea to its very extreme. Everyone in Amaroth looks exactly the same and have the shadow we feel about them. And of course through the fact that an entire half of them willingly sacrificed themselves twice. The second thing that makes Amaroth stand out is how it was implemented into the narrative. I refer to how it was tied to the whole souls concept. That the world and its people became fragmented and that everyone simply forgot this great city and how everyone is tied to it through their souls, through their past, and of course with things that utilize this concept such as the echo. It's a rather interesting spin on the utopia concept. Basically that it's tied to our souls and it's part of our history rather than something that simply exists as an abstract concept separated from everything else. Another fantastic implementation was actually showing it. I know this may sound a bit silly because we did play the story and it was told, but quite often that isn't the case. Even within the FF series, the perfect slash advanced society thing is usually simply something that happened ages in the past, and at best there might be only a few remnants of it remaining in the game proper. An example most of you are no doubt familiar with is the Setra and their promised land from Seven, which we never get to see, or at least in the original. The closest we had was 10, because we do get to see and briefly play in DZ, but DZ is arguable as it's advanced mainly by contrast to how horrible, fallen behind and stagnated the rest of the world is. But we'll talk more about DZ and 10 in a bit. What I am trying to say here is they could have, have simply Emmet Cell tell us of the ancients, and we would still have had a good story, but they went beyond that and had us actually experience it. Not just see it, but live it. It's one thing to simply have Emmet Cell talk about how great the ancients were, how magnificent Amaroth was and the life there, and another thing entirely to actually depict it as brilliantly as they did, and I will never not give the developers huge props for what they achieved here. That is something that you can only do in a video game, and that extra effort is what makes this story way stronger than it could have ever been as a book or as a movie. Let's talk about another distinct feature of this zone. First, I want to see if you can spot something in this image. Yes, that would indeed be the amount of side quests available. Also not seen in the picture is the fact that there aren't that many NPCs to talk to, all things considered. At a first glance this might seem a bit odd, lazy even. Why are there such few quests in Amarod when it's the final area of the game? Not to mention that this would go against what I was gushing about earlier regarding Shadowbringers having awesome side quest content and optional dialogue. However, I am strongly of the opinion that this was a deliberate choice. See, when constructing a story, there is an interesting method in which you don't reveal everything to the player. You give them a lot of lore, yes, but ultimately you want to leave certain things unanswered. Why? Well. First off, there's going to be a million questions the player will ask that you never even considered, so trying to answer everything is futile in the first place, but also, by leaving out certain bits of information, you make the player feel smarter, because they have to actually piece things together themselves. You also spark discussion, which is especially important if you remember the discussion we had earlier about Shadowbringers benefiting from being an MMO. But you don't want to overdo it or the player will get pissed at all the teasing, no payoff. So it becomes this delicate dance where you trickle feed information to the player and hope that they pay enough attention to start thinking about it and filling in the blank. Now, normally you want to do this only for stuff that is just flavor, but if you want an example of this idea being applied to an entire game, I basically refer to what From Software does with most of her games like Bloodborne 
or even the main plot of the game isn't explicitly told and has to be figured out. Coming back to F14, how this applies to Amarod is basically that they want to tell you only a little bit, just the important bits, with optional dialogue and optional quests. And there isn't much optional dialogue and there are only three optional quests, yes, but each piece of dialogue and each of the three side quests further elaborate on some important aspects of the Amarotin society, so they are used very much sparingly and in an efficient manner in terms of the amount of information being told. One of the side quests has the player attempt to create ropes that the Amarotoins use, only to end up in failure because of how weak your creation magics or your ability to use ether are. I love this quest because it further shows the disparity between how the ancients used to be and what people are now. That even creating a simple robe, even with much assistance, is way out of your reach. Another side quest shows us how the Amarotines were great thinkers, and we see through their debates the examination of the most core features of an utopia, questioning whether something can really be perfect, individualism versus collectivism, intervention slash world policing versus non-intervention slash isolation, but it ends without a conclusion, so we never find out what their stances really were. The third quest basically shows us how the creation of concepts thing works. There's also of course also the Academia and Eider side quest, which basically is a dungeon made of these concepts and it gives us a bit more insight into Mahabrea, which is always great. I also love how they turn the evil Ashian team into a banger jazz tune, so thank you for that, Mr. Soken. I definitely think that doing it this way was the right call. Imagine if you entered Amarod and you saw your minimaps as littered with side quests and there were hundreds of NPCs to talk to. That would totally kill the vibe. The city wouldn't feel special anymore because all of the mystique would vanish to thin air. It also wouldn't leave any room to further elaborate on the whole Amarod story in the future. But if you need further convincing, I can't tell you the amount of conversations I've had with my friends over the last two years all sorts of things regarding Amarod. Questions like, what relations did the ancients have to the other cities of the world? Did they actually let any into their city or trade with them? How did the rest of the world fare against the final days? How did the ancients deal with things like natural disasters? What were their view on new life forms that were formed post Zodiac? Obviously the convocation wanted to sack them to Zodiac, but was this an unanimous decision? Or were there people who were doubting it, besides Benat's gang, of course? Did they despise them in the same way that Emmet Selk despises fragmented people and thus they all went, yeah, why not, let's waste those guys, we don't like them anyway? Or did they show empathy towards them, thus making it a harder decision to sacrifice them? What were the exact roles of every single convocation member? How often did they cycle members? How exactly did the procedure go for electing them to office? What the hell was the deal with the noise they are talking about? Obviously it seems to be related to the cause of the final days, but what was it? And so many more. Honestly, I could keep going for ages, but hopefully I got my point across. Now if you say that the game actually does touch on the subjects I mentioned, you'd be right, and that is my point. You get just enough snippets to make you think about these points and open up discussion. So the game gives you the possibility to think about it without ever giving you a decisive answer. Meaning, you have plenty of thinking to do on the matter, which is awfully fitting as well, given the Amorotine society. The final element which makes Amarot so intriguing is the whole fakeness aspect. Basically, we know this is an illusion. It's all a fugazi, you know what a fugazi is? No, Fugazi, it's a uh, fake. Yeah, Fugazi, Fugazi, it's a wazi, it's a woozy, it's a f fairy dust. It doesn't exist. It's never landed. It is no matter. It's not on the elemental chart. It, it's not fucking real. <laughs> right? All right? All right. <laughs> Stay with me. Mm -hmm. Everything we see in Amarod is something that directly popped off Emmet Selk's head. Not only does it add a sort of a haunting atmosphere to the place, but also adds a whole new dimension to how you approach the situation because you can now assume a degree of bias in how the NPCs behave and such. Were their society really this perfect? 
Or is it simply that this is how Emmet Selk perceives it, due to his rose-tinted nostalgia goggles? Now, based on the information we learn, we can pretty safely infer that Emmet Selk isn't bullshitting to a large degree, which is to say that I am not implying that he one day went to smoke weed and cooked up this entire thing on the spot, though that would make the story rather hilarious. Rather, what I mean is that there could be at least a small degree of bias at play here, just enough that it makes you think about the situation from a different lens. There's also human error to take into account here. Sure, Emmet Selk remembers very clearly, but I wonder how many details have slipped over the last couple thousand years. This also offers a suitable explanation for why we don't have immediate access to a ton of information. In fact, the game even acknowledges this point with Hythrodeus. Since we are talking about Amaroth, we should also be talking about the dungeon, also called Amaroth. But I will have to blue ball you here, because I want to save it for when I discuss the ending at the end of the next video, as I feel it's much more fitting to talk about there. So for now, we will just have to move on, but don't worry, it will get its due praise. Thank you for fighting for this world, for believing. Fare you well, my friend, my inspiration. In this segment, I will just briefly talk about pacing and maybe feature some other minor things I couldn't fit into the other segments. So far, we've covered themes, design philosophy slash context, and a little bit of the tone. Now let's talk about pacing and tone more in detail, because this is a very important aspect to a story's success, and it warrants attention. So, Shadowbringer starts out quite a bit slower than the previous expansion storylines, and this is to be expected. Shadowbringers had a huge undertaking in that it was not just an expansion that had us go into a whole another world that we basically knew nothing of, but it was also burdened with having to tell us a whopping 80% of the game's major secrets. And doing all of that while expanding on the Ashian and Zodiac slash Heidelin story, as well as fleshing out the Scions more, on top of new characters that were added, while also giving us a compelling story. But I think they managed to pull it off rather beautifully, and I think a reason for that is that they tied the aforementioned things into the pacing. So let's start from the top. You enter Shadowbringers. Boom. Whole new world. From here, they start to slowly introduce you to elements about this world. You learn of the Flood of Light that happened 100 years ago, you learn about the Crystal Tower and its role in the story, well, sort of. You then see firsthand the opposing Empire faction of this game and what appears to be the main villain, Watry. Then, in Amarang, you learn more about the nature of the Sin Eaters, where they are established as the clear enemy, yet with a sad aspect of the nature of what these creatures used to be. But all this time you've been kinda wandering around without a goal, and you've not had any proper action yet. No dungeon, not even a solo instance. Though, it is worth mentioning that the reason there isn't a solo instance early on is because they didn't want a repeat of Roban Extreme. It's interesting to think though, if maybe there was a solo instance and it was removed due to this, or if the story was always made with that intention in mind. A place where I could potentially think of a solo instance happening is the Teslin death scene. You could have had that whole thing resolved there, but it was moved to the first dungeon. I think this was actually the right choice and another prime example of good pacing in Shadowbringers. They could have had a ton of drama as a response to Teslin's death, but they felt there was no need for that as it would have put the story to a halt. Also, this way it's much more fitting to Alize's character, so they didn't waste the player's time and instead put her as a boss in Holminster Switch, where you do still get an emotional response from Alize, not only through Trust's dialogue, but also a brief moment after the dungeon. 
Also, not turning it into a ton of drama meant the story didn't dictate what the player should think. So they just showed to us the transformation into a sin either raw, and it's really up to the player however they choose to react to it. It's a small thing, but I want to emphasize this because there's many great decisions like this throughout the story, and they absolutely do contribute a lot into making the story as buttery smooth as it was. Anyway, back on topic. It's been, well, according to my footage, it's about 2 hours 45 minutes into 5.0, but this obviously is just cutscene time. When you account for travel time, remember you don't have flying, and maybe you stopped to look around, appreciate the zones, talk to optional NPCs, maybe do a few side quests. This could easily have been like 4 to 7 hours depending on your pace until you actually unlock Hominster's switch. And indeed, I remember some of my friends didn't literally unlock this dungeon until the second day. Given that most JRPGs toss you into action within the first hour or less, that's quite a long stretch without any real action as far as gameplay is concerned. But I think this actually works in the story's favor, because unlike previous first dungeons, Dusk Bijung, which was literally an optional dungeon, and Siren Song Sea, which was essentially just filler, Hallminster Switch, by contrast, is actually quite a huge story event, and indeed, there won't be another dungeon with as much significance until basically Mount Gulg. So this longer build-up to it does make sense, since it was to be such a pivotal moment in the story. Even when I replayed it, I got chills on the cutscene where you return the night sky to Norvrand. It feels so freaking good to return that night sky because the developers put you on this journey where you get to see just how oppressing this world had been, and it's the first moment where you get a glimmer of hope as a player, like maybe this world can be saved. None of it would have worked if they just thrust you into action immediately. Another thing that is important to mention is that up until now, You've been sort of just existing in the first, learning about it, maybe you help some town folk here and there, but you're kind of just wandering aimlessly without a clear motive. But that all also changes after this dungeon, because now you get a very concrete and concise goal. Defeat the Light Warden in each of the five regions, which will save not only this world, but also the Source. But unbeknownst to you, you have also been having a goal this entire time. Which is the whole finding your party members aspect. The idea being, you go through this dying world looking for your friends, and each location is thematic to each character. And while going through, you learn much of not just the location, but about the character, and how they interact with that environment. You go searching for friends, not just so that they can discover themselves thanks to the ordeals that they have to overcome throughout the game, but to unite them in the fight to preserve your future and spare two worlds from unimaginable destruction. If this sounds like Miss Ishikawa was inspired by Final Fantasy VI for this aspect of the story, that is indeed probable. It worked two and a half decades ago, and it sure as hell worked in 2019, so why not? It's a brilliant way to accomplish three things at once. You have a motive for why you are in this world, which is clearing out the Light Wardens. You then have a motive to enter a new zone, for the exploration aspect. And you have a motive to enter that location, to meet up with one of the Scions, not just to have them join your party thanks to the trust system, but also to find out what they have been up to and how they relate to what you are doing in that location. These three points are therefore all intertwined thanks to the setup of the story and it creates a very smooth loop for the player and this loop is used all the way up until Mount Gulk essentially, though it could be argued that even your reason for visiting the Tempest is because of Grahatia and to restore the night but in all of the zones but they mix extra things with it. I'll talk about that part of the game in a bit. My point is, they use this idea and it really enhances the story because it's not a one note, you always have multiple things going on, always multiple reasons for doing what you are doing. 
Another thing I wanted to mention here, I love the scenes at the inn that you get at the end of each segment. This is such a cool callback to many other JRPGs, past FF titles in particular, where it was common to have a scene play during the night where characters got a moment to bond and share personal feelings during the night. It adds a nice feeling to the whole thing. I also love that they use this as a way to mainly develop an artbird's character and show the bond he shares with the warrior flight. It is also in this structure where they weave in those major mysteries slash secrets slash lore bombs I was talking about, whatever you wanna call them, where after doing something for a while, you get some huge bit of information dropped on you, which also serves to keep the player engaged in the story, because you can't wait to find out what crazy shit you learn this time. That's how calamities work? That's how elements work? Zodiac and Heidung and our fucking primals? We are all fragmented beings of these powerful ancients and some of those ancients were Asians? This was all a result of an apocalyptic event called the Final Days? These huge bombshells are dropped on the player left, right and center and it feels awesome because you realize just how little you truly knew about the FF14 world as it all opens up right in front of your eyes and you can't wait to scoop up some more of that lore like a crack addict. I also love how it's all dropped on you as well. The game basically doesn't care if you are ready for all this information, you are getting it anyway. It's like having a kid thrown into school for the first time and 1 plus 1 equals 2 being revealed to them. It blows their freaking mind. Another interesting element I should mention is that throughout the story, though it's quite rare, you get to see scenes in the source. You have basically this Gaius Estinian Zenos subplot playing in the background, which helps break up the pacing every once in a while. I also find the choice of characters for this subplot interesting, where Gaius represents a realm in Born, Estinian represents Heavensward, and Zenos represents Stormblood. They're basically telling us a story that consists of pivotal characters of the past stories while we are in another world. Kind of a neat thing they did there. Anyway, Shadowbringers uses this structure of go to a new location, learn about that location, learn what a scion has been up to, they become a party member, track down and kill the Light Warden, Night Sky is returned, get rewarded with some nice ass lore bomb. There's also some sort of obstacle that happens at some point most of the time related to Ilmore trying to stop you and finally it's usually associated with a chill time scene at the inn where Artbird reflects on your most recent journey. The game maybe throws these elements around a bit, maybe mixes it up a bit, but it's the core structure for the story. For example, on your first visit to Amarang, you learn about the Mord, the inn at the journey's head and all that stuff, and you meet up with Alice while finding out what the Sin Eaters are like. But in your second visit, the story focused more on recruiting Reen as a party member, not Alize, and it's on this visit you learn about Twine and the whole minor aspect of Amarang. The threat of Ilmore is still presented through the encounter with Ranjit, and of course you go and defeat the Light Warden together at the end, and restore the Night Sky and your reward, besides the Night Sky and Tancred slash Reen's arc getting a payoff, essentially getting Reen as a new party member, is Emmet Selk telling you about the effects of the Sundering and elaborates more on how calamities occur. Since this is how most of the story flows, I won't talk too much about those segments, so I will simply skip ahead a bit here. Let's talk about the bit right after Raktika. This is where you return to the Crystarium, and while the words of both Emmet Selk and Ustola still linger on in your mind, the whole place gets attacked by Sin Eaters, led by Votri. From Holminster's switch until this point, though we have been facing obstacles and the stories has still maintained that dark vibe, we nonetheless have been pretty much winning non-stop and overcoming any obstacle that has been thrown at us. Then they kick you in the nuts to remind you that you are playing Shadowbringers and there's no winning here. <laughs> I love it. But after this comes a segment that I've seen people dislike on quite a few occasions. The second half of Amarang, or the trolley segment, whatever you want to call it. 
I've even seen people go as far as to say that this was an actual bad part of the story, even if they loved the rest of it. And all this comes down to pacing. People felt it was too slow here, and that it was just filler. But I myself don't see it as out of place or poorly paced at all. In fact, I found this segment to be quite awesome. Let me explain why. First of all, having a slower pace in the story at this point in time makes perfect sense. Between the Kitana Rabo dungeon and the Sin Eater attack solo instance, the story has been really action-packed recently. You restored the night sky to Raktika despite Ilmor's interference, and you just learned of one of the biggest twists of the entire story, about Heidelin and Zodiac being primals. After all of that, the story needs to slow the heck down, big time. You don't go full throttle after the story had been so eventful. Second, this subplot with the trolley may at first glance seem like it's inconsequential and adds nothing to the story, but that is only looking at its surface level. This section of the game is in fact one of the most important moments in the game. After seeing a ton of tiny trinkets of the riders showing the players the relationship between Tankard and Reen, and getting to see tiny bits of character growth for each of them here and there throughout the story, thus far we finally get to resolve this hanging plot thread that had been teasing us almost this entire time. But that's not what people complain about, right? They complain about the trolley bit, oh it's an useless part of the story, just remove it. Okay. Let's talk about the trolley bit. So what is the story here? To pass through this gate to get to where Minfilia and Tancred last talked in Nabath Arang, they have to use the Talos. They can't fly with Amaro or something like that because of Ilmor and presence in disguise, and they are trying to be discreet. The problem is, the Talos is broken, right? And it's a hard thing to fix. Not that many individuals have the know-how. But there's a Talos expert in this city called Magnus. The focus of this subplot then becomes basically get this Talos running and in the process learn the story of Twine as well as of Magnus and what happened to him. But Magnus is just a side character, why does he get an entire section? Now we finally come to the reason why this subplot isn't just filler and actually serves a purpose in the overall narrative. Here we have someone who has pretty much lost everything, and I don't mean that in the meme sense, I mean that sincerely. He lost his child to a sin eater, even despite specifically trying his best to avoid that very thing from happening, and then lost his wife to a cave collapse. Meaning, in both instances, he didn't even get the chance to properly bury them. Then we of course further pile on the fact that this world is in an innately terrible state, and so you can imagine how it completely broke this man. His enthusiasm towards Talos was gone, you can forget all about that, since it serves only as a painful reminder of how his wife died while trying to get materials for a Talos heart. And so, the only thing he had left to distract him in this miserable life was to drink himself to an early grave. When he sees the stone that his wife left as a departing gift for him, he can't look at it because he would then have to confront what happened and come to terms with it. But it's too painful for him, so instead he doesn't want to look at it at all and goes back to drinking. But in the end, despite him trying his best to use any means to distract him from the pain, it always comes back. He sees the tunnels come to life and at this point you would expect a full 180, for he's all happy about everything, but no. He looks at the Talos, and it serves to remind him further, and he curses out the Talos and what his wife left behind, because he cannot come to terms with it. He doesn't want to inherit this pile of junk, he wants the person he loved to come back. Everything displayed here is a one-to-one -one reflection of the story of Minfilia, Tancred and Reen. Tancred lost Minfilia and doesn't want to confront the situation, which would be being open to Reen and leaving no words unsaid, and instead tries his best to distract him from having to confront it at any turn. The trauma he has from losing Minfilia is so great that seeing something that represents her serves only to drive him further to his shell. Ancred sees in Magnus himself, 
and it makes him realize how emotionally hurtful the approach he's taking is, and it is a huge driving force behind him finally overcoming this hurdle. Likewise, when Reen sees Magnus cursing out the Talos, it makes her realize that she is in that very situation. She is that Talos, because she has this preconceived notion that formed as a result of Tancred not disclosing his true feelings, that Tancred doesn't care about her at all and just wants Minfilia back, and when she sees Magnus react to the Talos in such a way, it makes this opinion further cemented in her brain and she can't take it anymore, which then of course leads to that one incredible scene with Urianje. All of this leads to one thing after the other, which eventually culminates in the completion of both of their story arcs, so no, the trolley segment isn't wasted space or filler or whatever people like to label it as. It's a crucial moment in developing Tancred and Reen, and without it, the payoff at the end would have been shallow. My own take is that I assume the reason this part of the game gets a bad rap from some is because I have seen quite a few people who went into the story hating Tancred from the get-go due to the way he's treating Reen at the start. They then force this hate relationship to the character solely based on first impressions, so naturally when they get to this part of the story, they aren't invested in Tancred and thus see it as a poorly paced segment with no purpose in the story. But please understand that just because you dislike a character doesn't mean there wasn't a solid reason for this section to exist. Another use of pacing and tone that I want to highlight is with Mount Gulg and the end of 5.0. The bit where the entire world comes together to build the giant Talos. This was such an incredible moment in the game. Sure, it's very cheesy and very JRPG tropey in how every single soul in existence comes together to share a common goal, but it's the awesome type of cheesiness. This plays so well into the strengths of Shadowbringers. Remember the bit where we talked about the world being small in scale? Now where is that point used better than right here? The entire world coming together like this is actually believable because of how small the setting is played out to be and also because we gave these people hope and strength and we raised their spirits. Of course they're all inspired and fired up to help us overcome this one final obstacle. Here the story takes a dip again for a while in terms of pacing as it's a slow build up to entering Mount Gulg, but oh man does it hype you up and pay off big time. Mount Gulg to me is fascinating because it reminds me of something that they like to do in the past, especially with some of the much older titles from the SNES slash PSX era, where the writers and the developers essentially troll the player by building up a section of the game to be the end, to make a dungeon feel like a final dungeon, and a logical endpoint with a final boss, and then turn around and say, you thought that was the final dungeon? You ain't seen nothing yet. As something even bigger happens. While it is a form of illusion, it's actually a rather effective way to build up the actual final act of the game. You may not even register this consciously, but you probably did on a subconscious level buy into this hype with Mount Gulk. This place has final dungeon written all over it. We have the obvious final confrontation with Watery being the last Light Warden, and we even have Ranjit acting as the kind of front slash henchman villain with Watery being the real villain pulling the strings dynamic going throughout the story, which gives credibility to him being the actual last boss. We have the fact that this is the final goal of the game, it's the last area we have to restore. We have the fact that there are no locations left to visit in the world. We've already been everywhere else, so what else is there left? We also have already gathered all the party members there seemingly are to obtain, with all of them having gone through their respective story arcs. We have the whole aspect of the entire world coming together to cheer on and allow the heroes to win, a very common JRPG trope that 99% of the time leads to the end of the game. The dungeon itself has a very strong last dungeon vibe, with the song being a heroic last push, it being full voice acted, tons of unique enemy and monster designs and very impressive aesthetics. 
you got the symbolism aspect, you know, with descending up this heavenly looking place. And of course, Votri himself is someone who could easily pass off as a final boss. An orchestrated boss team version of the main theme of the story, a very cool and flashy final boss transformation, phenomenal voice acting and sound plus visual effects work. In fact, this whole segment with Mount Gook and the Innocence boss fight, you could straight up port it into any other RPG and it would be a 10 out of 10 very high quality final dungeon and final boss combo. Like, Mount Gook by itself would utterly destroy many other actual final dungeons is what I'm trying to say here. There are of course some plot threads hanging, like Emmet Silk, Artbird, Elidibus, but those things are something that could be easily resolved in the post 5.0 MSQ. But it's not just in terms of design and gameplay, and narratively this too fits perfectly. This is the highest point in the entire game in terms of tone. This is literally where everything is going at its best. After you defeat Watery, it all seems to point towards a bittersweet yet happy ending. You get the Grahatia face reveal, and as his plan is laid out to you, you realize Oh, so that's why he had that whole solo instance bonding moment and the talk he gave just before entering the dungeon was him saying his goodbyes to us because he knew he would die. It all comes full circle and it all sets you up towards that kind of a bittersweet ending. They even play the literal ending song here. I mean, wow. And it's all topped off with Grahatia literally looking at the camera and smiling saying farewell to both the warrior flight as well as the player, thanking him for saving the world. Boom, story's done boys, roll the credits. And then this happens. Emmet Selk appears and everything goes to shit real quick. You may have heard the saying, when you are at the top, there's only one way to go, which describes what happens here rather well. Just now, things were going your way in the best way that they've ever went throughout this story. Everything seemed to resolve quite nicely and you would have all went home back to the source with the first being saved. You were literally here at the top. Then, within just a few minutes, things get worse. And worse. And worse. Until all of a sudden you are at the rock bottom. Everything you achieved throughout the entire story has been completely and utterly nullified, with the return of the light everywhere. But it's not even as if you were back to square one. No, you are actually way worse off than you were at the start of the game. You've lost Grahatia, which has two severe consequences. One is that Emmet Selk will be trying to use his power to trigger a dozen calamities, so you have essentially given your enemy an easy button they can press to win. But also, Grahatia in many ways was the glue holding the Crystarium and thus the entire world together. And so were you. Now he is missing, and you are dying a slow, horrible death. How long do you think it's going to take until people turn to despair again? Especially after they put in all that effort into building the Talos, only to have the light return, not just in Colusia, but all over the world. That means the return of the Sin Eaters in full force. The return of death and despair. Oh, and just for good measure, let me mention this again. You are dying a slow and horrible death, where you are forced in a situation where either the Scions kill you, thereby transferring all the Light Warden energy to someone else, or by you succumbing and killing them and probably everyone else in this world. So yeah, fun decisions ahead. Oh, and the worst thing? You pretty much caused all of this. Now, I briefly want to mention something here because some of you are probably thinking, well, I never thought Mount Gook would be the last dungeon because obviously it's a level 79 dungeon, and I never thought the Warrior Flight was in danger, because they can't kill the main character in an MMO. For me, it's mainly interesting to look back at it from a storytelling perspective. From the lens of looking at it strictly as a game, 
Sure, it's not particularly interesting, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't well written and constructed from a storytelling perspective. Even if you acknowledge these things, you will still have most likely felt the way it was played out in the narrative. It is a shame though, this is probably the biggest part where Shadowbringers being an MMO actively detracted from the experience because in a regular single player JRPG, there would have been way more dread, urgency and tension surrounding the warrior flight situation here. And if you're someone who has only played F14 from the series and you think they don't kill main characters, oh boy, do I have some news for you. No spoiling, but those of you who know, know. Anyways, back to talking about tone and pacing. Like I said, this is the lowest point that you have ever been. Not just in Shadowbringers, but arguably of the entire story in F14. Yes, even post 2.5 doesn't compare to how bad things get here. But they then do something interesting. The story then almost takes a pause, if you will. As you follow Emmet Selk into the Tempest, the game starts to hint at something that was always on your mind, but you never really asked because you didn't expect the game to actually give you an answer. Why do Emmet Selk and the Asians do what they do, causing calamities and untold destruction? What could be the driving force that causes them to take such drastic measures? Now, obviously by this point you do know that the world was split. Emmet Selk doesn't consider these fragmented beings as individuals that are alive, etc. But that is only surface level. You are still missing the emotional component. That is to say, while you see what they are doing, you register what they are doing, but you do not really understand it. It's sorta of like reading about a war in a history book. Yeah, you can sorta of get the idea, this and that war were terrible, lots of people died, but they don't materialize in your head the same way if you had, say, your grandfather tell you about the horrors that he personally faced during World War II and seeing how painful it is for him to talk about it. It is that emotional connection that makes us better sympathize and understand what was actually going on. That is this segment of the game in a nutshell. Throughout the story you learned the what's and how's of the Asians, but it is now that you will find out the why. And it's done beautifully. The reason this works so well is precisely because we had that super high peak just earlier. So we can afford to take our time here since all that build up was just released and now we are slowly building it back up again. I love how smoothly the Amorod segment sets you up for the final boss. It does it so discreetly that you don't even notice. Then the confrontation with Emmet Selk. Here, if you can believe it, the story manages to plummet even more from where you were before. Here's where the taste of defeat starts to really sink in. This guy is someone who isn't fragmented versus your pleb souls. Remade an entire city with the reconstituted souls of the dead. Remade an entire hellish apocalyptic event that was the final dungeon of the game and has lived for thousands upon thousands of years. And now you get to see him in action. They of course take out the twins first because they know that the player is most likely the most attached to them, so strong shock reaction right off the bat. And you see how the warrior flight immediately jumps to action from seeing this as well. Then he removes Ushtonga and Urianje effortlessly. And even Reen's and Tancred's plan of containing your light fails as he takes out both Tancred and her simultaneously like it's nothing. All the while you are riding in pain, barely able to even walk after you have been fully exhausted from containing the light for this long as well as going through that dungeon just now. This moment right here in the story is the lowest it ever got in all of F14. You have lost in every single conceivable way. If you were at the very bottom of the chart before, now you are not even on the chart anymore, you managed to go below it, that's how low you sunk. 
It then cuts to a white scene with no music, just some white noise in the background, and all you see is Arthur towering above you. And, well, I don't need to describe the rest, y'all know what happens. After all this failing, failing, and failing, one kick in the nuts after the other, they catapult you right back up. Arthur merges with your soul, you get up, and they start just machine gunning one uplifting slash hype thing one after the other. We fight as one. Yes! This is our future. Our story. Yes! Yes! That expanse contract. Eon become instant. Champions from beyond the rift, heed my call! Yes! Yes! I am Hades, he who shall awaken our brethren from their dark slumber. Yes! This must have been the most hyped I was to fight a final boss in ever, honestly. And the reason it works is because of all the elements I have been talking about so far. The triumphant push and victory in Mount Gulk that was done to such epic proportions that it basically fakes you out into thinking that that was the last dungeon. Then the sudden and extreme nose dive, followed by a long period where you get to have everything sink in, followed into making you sink even lower and then, finally, pulling it back up into another extreme by lifting up the players by dropping hyped up things on them lightning fast and getting them giga excited to fight the final boss. This method of alternating between extreme ends of high and low points and so rapidly is kind of a dangerous thing to do in writing, but it paid off big time here and resulted in Emmet Selk being cemented as one of the single most iconic villains not just in F14 but in all of Final Fantasy. And arguably he deserves to be rated among the best villains in fiction ever. And while there's been plenty of stories that have utilized this method, in fact it's not even that rare, what makes Mish Ishikawa's writing stand out is the other form of pacing I have failed to mention all this time, and that is pacing on a more microscopic scale. Whenever you see people discuss pacing, it is almost always exclusively in regards to pacing on a larger scale. This basically refers to the speed at which the plot of the story progresses, going from chapter to chapter, plot to subplot, section to section. While this is important, a huge blunder that many people make is failing to acknowledge how important pacing is on a smaller scale. In other words, from scene to scene, line to line, sentence to sentence even. Granted, a big reason for this is because quite frankly, it's not as interesting to talk about, as it's much harder to provide examples that amount to something significant seeing as they are, you know, small in scale. But when added up, small-scale pacing is just as important to a story's success as large-scale pacing, and in fact, I think that it is in the microscopic sense of pacing where a writer's experience really shows, because it really is something that you learn over time. A skilled writer can make dialogue flow like a smooth river, and you never question the speed at which things are being exchanged, which is a mark of a well-written, well-paced dialogue. An interesting element to add here is game development, and F14 being an MMO, plus an MMO using a very outdated engine full of spaghetti code at that. I really commend Mish Ishikawa's ability to not just write a good overarching story and good character dialogue, but also, and people often tend to forget about this, her ability to then communicate those ideas to the different developers and make manifest the scene as close as it played out in her head as possible, whether that's working with the artists, the animators, the composer, etc. etc. I must sound like a huge fanboy right now, but I mean everything I am saying 100% sincerely. I have a lot of appreciation for her work and to the entire dev team of FF14 for that matter. Oh, but we aren't done yet. We still have the second part of the story to cover. 
post 5.0, I would basically describe like this Yao in Star Wars, right? The original trilogy. Yeah, those movies were a bit obscure, so it's understandable if you didn't. Anyway, I would say that 5.0 is a new hope. 5.1 and 5.2 are Empire Strikes Back and 5.3 is Return of the Jedi. Basically, 5.0 introduces us to this really well-crafted world and tells an amazing story in its own right. 5.1 and 5.2 then takes a step back from all the high points and focuses more on further exploring the world as we get to see more of how Ilmor, the Crystarium, the Ondo and the Vs are doing and what they are up to after 5.0. We get to see more of what the main cast are doing and get to bond with them further. The Eden raid deals with Reen, Tancred and Urianje, which is an 8-man raid, yes, but it ties into the MSQ this time, so it needs to be mentioned here. While the MSQ shows Grahatia, Alize, Alfino and Ustola plus some side characters. And of course, they slowly set up Elidibus to be the final boss of this entire story arc. The main plot during this segment is basically trying to figure out how to get Scions back to the source. It's a slow plot and the world is in relatively the same state at the end of 5.2 as it was at the end of 5.0, but that's the point. The purpose of this portion of the story is to be more chill and just look at how the world and the characters are doing. There's a sentiment I sometimes see within the community where people bash these in-between patches but I've always been fond of them myself. I love when we can take things a bit slower, put the plot aside and just enjoy the characters of the story. Then 5.3 is obviously the lead up to the climax, climax and conclusion of the entire Shadowbringer story arc and don't worry, I will be gushing it hardcore later down the line. I wanted this to be its own segment here because I didn't know where else to put it. So we've talked about the potential inspirations from games like 3, 4, 8 and 9. But something I have not seen people mention that much is the parallels between Shadowbringers and FF10. Which I am sure is just me becoming crazy and having a wild imagination. Both games feature a setting that has been stagnated for an incredibly long period of time. And the solution to this stagnation is sending someone special from another world to, to inspire them and the party to give them hope and show that there is another way. This special character is also the protagonist of the story and both protagonists are symbolized with the sun as opposed to another character being the moon. The threat Inspira and Norrand are named after this idea of sin that it slash they are a punishment for their sins. Both games also feature a being slash beings that can never be fully defeated because they are always reborn and the protagonist is instrumental in preventing them from being reborn and thus defeat them for good. Both games feature an important character wanting to sacrifice themselves for the greater good and a major theme is realizing why this is bad as it's sacrificing yourself to change nothing. You also have an undead companion who went through failure before, short of guiding the protagonist along their path towards saving the world. Then there's the parallels between Amarod and Dream Xanargand. Highly advanced civilizations with a water team, they also exist both as a magical recreation by their leaders and also as a real location as ruins. The magical recreations both act similarly, where it's a location essentially within a bubble, where people simply live their lives as they did before the calamitous event that killed everyone, fully unaware of what they really are or what is happening in the real world. The Ancients in 14 sacrificing half their number to summon the Primal Zodiac is very similar to Yu Yevon sacrificing everyone in Xanarkand to preserve their people and memories and summoning Sin. Even as locations, they are both remote and far to the side in an ocean. On top of this, you also have the obvious references like the addition of Ronso, some F10 names like Piran and Kelk. You literally have the Thunder Plains as a location, etc. Of course, this may all just be conjecture, but I feel like drawing at least some inspiration from F10 makes sense. 
After all, they were making a story where you have this very stagnated setting and we travel from another world to save it. The closest to such a setup in the series is definitely FF10. This is then combined with FF3 and FF4's use of the light slash dark team and presto, you got Shadowbringers. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that. It also makes sense that F10 wasn't heavily featured like F3 was because F3 fits right in with all this light slash dark stuff as well as the Crystal Tower, Eternal Wind, and so on. Anyway, this wasn't anything too serious. Just some shower thoughts I had when I thought of FF10 and its relation to Shadowbringers. I mainly wanted to bring it up, but with Anima making an appearance in Endwalker and all that. Okay, let's talk about the time travel aspect of Shadowbringers. But first, let me address a complaint that I have heard before of how time travel is inconsistent since Shadowbringers uses multiverse slash splintered time travel theory while the Alexander story features a closed time loop. The difference is that Alexander, by looking into the future, saw no outcome where it could serve its intended purpose, decided to deliberately create a stable time loop that is closed and one that has the potential to be looped only once or however many times, assuming that one follows the same path every time. But the action of the warrior flight defeating Alexander serves to both start and break the loop, ergo we end up with Alexander's story's conclusion where we do break the loop, but Alexander itself remains in time stasis. If you hate time travel, bear with me here. The key point here is that we can safely infer that Alexander, being as powerful as it was, could actually have changed the future, but it specifically chose not to. It chose to go for a closed time loop so that it can create the most optimal scenario. Thus, the way time travel is used in Shadowbringers does not contradict the way it was used in Alexander. The Ironworks created another way to use Alexander's powers, and thus used different directives thus resulting in a splintered timeline rather than the closed time loop in Alexander. The mistake here is assuming that there were similar circumstances simply because time travel exists in both situations. Also, the writers probably don't want you to think about it too much anyway, as FF14 doesn't put that much of an emphasis on time travel regardless, which is why I don't particularly mind the inclusion of time travel into Shadowbringers. I think it was used to basically just enforce this situation where we have to go to the first instead of going into Garland mode as the story had led us to believe. Alright, let us talk about the music of Shadowbringers. This goes without saying, but I freaking love the music in Shadowbringers. I think Mr. Sokken and everyone involved did an absolute superb job and the soundtrack is nothing short of pure art. It nails the exact tone the player should be feeling every single time and is full of unique, atmospheric, emotional songs. And we of course have our uplifting and banger songs where you can't help but crank that BGM up to 100 whenever you hear them. The music in Shadowbringers does have a ton of variety so it's hard to pinpoint what they went for overall, but I myself feel like it does mostly have these somber, melancholic undertones. Now, I don't mean in the same way that Heavensward did, for example. I mean it more in a sad, depressing, this world is dying and we are struggling kind of a way, if that makes sense. This is of course the most prevalent in field themes like Amarang and Colusia, but you could argue they exist in some capacity in more or less in all of the field themes. In Stormblood, the boss team, Triumph, was this powerful battle team where you gave your all to fight for your freedom, whereas Shadowbringer's equivalent, Insatiable, is much less uplifting and in so doing captures the desperation and the struggle in trying to save this world, but still uplifting enough that it gives you that push to fight the powerful being in front of you and bring the hope that this world desperately needs. The lyrics further cement this feeling, with the singing being about the world being lost to the light and how we should be terrified and wary of these so-called angels aka the Sin Eaters beings of light. I also like the addition of having the line we fall repeat seven times. 
representing how seven worlds like this have already been destroyed in the umbral calamities and how we are fighting to prevent the same from happening to the first. It may not be in every song that this feeling is captured. Of course, you have your uplifting songs, your actions less hype songs and so on. But the songs that do elicit this feeling are frequent and or impactful enough that it gives that overall feel to the whole thing. So the thing I said earlier about Shadowbringers having new blood working on it applies to music as well. They had two new recruits join the sound team during the development for Shadowbringers and interestingly they had absolutely zero experience in the industry. And what's even crazier, they had both of them start arranging songs almost right away. Mr. Soken basically looked at their talents and strength and said, okay, you get to do an orchestral arrangement and you get to do a rock arrangement. He had them work on Eden's songs because those are obviously songs already established. They just needed to put their own spin on it. And so Force Your Way and Blinding Indigo were born and those new composers would go on to produce other songs for the Eden Raids as well. This was a brilliant move for many reasons. One, I always felt like Mr. Soken is at his best whenever he creates something fully from scratch. So having other people remix Mr. Uematsu's song was a good way to allow him to keep expressing himself. Additionally, it allowed them to space out music a lot better. This 8-man trounces any previous 8-mans in the amount of new music and it also meant that Mr. Soken could have more time to produce songs for the MSQ. Finally, the whole thing I talked about much earlier in the video about having fresh blood is always a good thing and adds to the variety. On top of this, this was the first time where Mr. Uematsu couldn't work on the main team due to essentially fatigue and wanting to slow down, which you can't really blame the man for. This is of course fully understandable, but it did have a significant effect on the development of Shadowbringers, more so than most people might think. This was pretty huge because the main team is pretty much the backbones upon which the rest of the soundtrack is built on, so this gave Mr. Soken a ton of creative freedom to fully express himself for the soundtrack of the Shadowbringers story. And he took a pretty big risk with the main team itself. See, he wanted to focus on having the guitar as the main instrument of this song, that's quite unusual, since most often the mainline FF titles have a more orchestral setup going for them, but he nonetheless felt like having a guitar beat the emphasis was fitting due to the whole taking back the night sky concept and Dark Knight being the poster job for the expansion. Still, he was quite worried of the reception. Would people think it's a bit too out of place for a Final Fantasy to have this guitar-heavy main theme? But Mr. Soken, being the legend that he is, basically said, Nah, I'll make this work, damn it. So he polished and polished the song until it fit the fleeting, poignant, and melancholic facets of the story, all without needing to compromise on keeping the guitar as the instrument of focus. He did this by doing some music wizardry. I don't really know how to explain this stuff, but he did it, that's the important part. And he pulled it off brilliantly. And no wonder the man can work so many different styles, far be it from me to ever doubt him. While his previous work on FF14 was phenomenal, I think this factor contributes as to why Shadowbringers was truly even more outstanding, because it's 100% all his work, his baby essentially, and you really feel it in the soundtrack how he went all out. In addition, they also got new vocals to replace Susan Calloway, who alone sang the previous three. So they got new singers for this one. Yes, singers, plural. This is awesome not just to have a completely new person doing the vocals, but having a male and a female singer, though kinda cliche, was used to great effect with this song, where most of Shadowbringers is in minor key and male vocals, while Tomorrow and Tomorrow and the first part of Shadowbringers is in major key and female vocals thus creating a nice contrast and fitting to where the respective songs would play in the story. The male vocals were done by Jason Charles Miller, who then also went on to sing To The Edge, who also used to play Roban before they made that shift from the US to the UK and rehired a bunch of voice actors. 
amazing singer and great guy. He was really enthused about singing both of those songs and really went above and beyond to deliver the best performance he could give. He literally recorded four separate versions for Shadowbringers and sang high notes to the ed into the edge even though they said it wouldn't be necessary. And then you of course had Amanda Eichen Kenan on the female vocals, another great singer and a nice replacement for Susan Calloway. It also means that if you somehow dislike Mr. Uematsu's work, you should have a much higher chance of loving this team instead then. I could definitely gush more about the Shadowbringers main theme or many of the songs in Shadowbringers, but first of all I'm no musician. My knowledge on music theory is lacking and it would be going a bit too off topic I feel. If you want to hear more gushing regarding the music in FF14, I can wholeheartedly recommend checking out Alex Mokala's YouTube channel. He covers many of the songs in this game and in other JRPGs and properly analyzes them and does a terrific job at it. Something that I have to criticize somewhat harshly when it comes to the music is turning a song that was themed after a specific character or thing and applying it elsewhere, thus ruining its unique connection to said thing. Now I want to emphasize that this is not a major complaint, not in the slightest, but I want to bring it up because I'm not here to simply fanboy the game for hours on end, though you could argue I have, I want to disclose all my thoughts surrounding it. Anyway, as usual, let's use some examples. There's this team, Bedlam's Brink. This song first plays when they show Emmet Selk in 4.4 and it always had a strong connection to Emmet Selk for me. It really fits his nature, this enigmatic and scheming figure who carries this aura of dread around him at all times, where even though he appears to be passive and not doing anything immediately dangerous, you can't help but feel that there is much more to him and he's way more powerful than he's letting on. It fits him so nicely. But then they started to essentially spam this song constantly. It even plays in many forms of side content a lot. I think this completely waters down the impact of the song. And they've been doing this in the past with many other songs. You had this theme associated with Genos, which funnily enough was originally Nails theme, but I can kinda let that slide because, you know, 1.0. But then they did the same thing, they started applying it to other characters like Ranjit or Midgard Somers theme becoming a generic first brute theme song. Or to use another Shadowbringers example, I feel like Insatiable way overstayed its welcome. The song was amazing when Shadowbringers first came out because it was a song mainly associated with the Light Wardens. In fact, if I had to describe this theme, I would say it's the Light Warden boss theme. But then it was used on so many bosses where the song definitely doesn't fit at all when it comes to the atmosphere. It's even more ridiculous when it plays against bosses in 5.4 and 5.5, where we are not even in the first anymore. It basically went from an amazing boss theme associated with the Light Wardens and the overall struggle of the first, to simply generic boss theme we must play on every boss. Especially more so when they made the Primal's arrangement be the mid boss theme. So now you heard it three times more essentially. Though granted they do emit a slightly different vibe although I would have preferred if the mid boss version would have cut out the lyrics completely. Basically what I am saying is that they should have kept Insatiable as a boss theme exclusive to just the Light Wardens and the last boss of Amaroth. Maybe the last boss of Heroes Gauntlet as well, but use another more generic boss theme for everything else. And when I say generic, I don't mean bad, I mean a boss theme that isn't so specialized as Insatiable. A boss theme that simply gets you pumped up to fight an important enemy. Now I do understand that because this is an MMO, there is such a huge volume of content that it is simply not feasible for them to make a unique theme song for every single instance and every single character. And I understand that if they keep these songs tied to specific situations or characters, what we would end up with is very repetitive music in most instances, especially inside content. And this is actually something they addressed in Shadowbringers, I might add. I might add, there's way more of a variance of music so that's the positive that comes from doing it. I guess I mean to say that it's more of a pick your poison kind of a thing. <laughs> and lord knows I don't want them to overwork Mr. Soken, especially given all that he had been through recently. 
But while I do understand and see where the developers are coming from, I still can't help but give this critique. You know, if you look at some of the more iconic FF characters such as Rydia, Kefka, Sephiroth, Tifa, Auron, etc. All of them have their own awesome and unique teams that are fully dedicated to just them. And when I say team, I'm not talking about how Emmet Selk, for example, has his boss team. I am talking about a non-combat related team that really accentuates the character's personality and the story that surrounds them and gives them the presence they need whenever it plays. The more you use them in scenarios that are not associated with said character or team, the more you cheapen it and it becomes blurred. It basically turns it into a generic team for X emotion instead of being associated with X character or idea. And I consider this a genuine flaw, a mistake. In Shadowbringers or FF14's narrative as a whole, as I believe every major character should have their unique theme song and they should be used sparingly to have maximum impact. You especially shouldn't first tie a certain theme to a specific character and then later turn it into a generic song used to describe different situations because now you lost the unique connection that song had to that specific character. Though I will say that Shadowbinger still did a better job at it than before. There are actually quite a few themes unique to certain characters, even though most of them are either from an older FF title or used earlier. Twilight over Tanalan, a previously 1.0 exclusive song, is associated with Tancred. Matoya's theme is associated with Ustola, which you could argue it always kinda was. Where I Belong from FF8 is associated with Reen and Gaia. Eternal Wind is associated with Grahatia. And what has to be my absolute favorite, Shadowbringers can be associated with many things and elements from the story, but could be mainly interpreted as the Warrior of Light's theme, who at that point has fused with Arbord and has become one and the same, which I'll talk about in the next video. And to go along with that, More Than Truth, a sad version of Maker's Ruin, is of course none other than Arbord's theme. All of these could be very well considered the theme songs of each respective character as they play more or less exclusively when associated with said characters and I do appreciate that. That in itself is already much better than what we had before. There are also some notable cases where while not 100% or close to 100% exclusive to a certain character I think very much strongly ties in with a certain character. In Shadowbringers, Mr. Sokken wanted to bring out the themes of the expansion not just by having similar melodies and light motifs, but also by having the same vocals occur across multiple songs where they might play in different places, but you hear the same lyrics, which alongside the same melody makes you feel how everything ties together and you get that moment of yes when you hear that line and associate it with the themes of the story. He did this a lot across many songs and it worked wonderfully.
Shadowbringers, like Stormblood, does also feature some nice works from two other legendary composers in the series, Mr. Uematsu and Mr. Sakimoto, in the form of the Eden Raids and Save the Queen storyline respectively. So all these factors combined, Mr. Soken getting to create the main team for the story, getting fresh and new composers to do a few songs here and there, getting new singers, having more time to compose for the MSQ, the setup with the expansion going to an entirely new world, allowing Mr. Soken to express his freedom, much more, more focus on vocals, more focus on tying certain themes to specific characters and still having that old style present inside content, all combines to make Shadowbringers soundtrack very unique, emotional, varied, amazing, incredible, superb and look I'm running out of adjectives here so let's move on. Sound design wise, Shadowbringers is also a massive improvement over the previous expansions. This is a bit hard to put into specific examples but you definitely feel like there is first of all way more sound effects utilized but they also are more varied and of higher quality. But some very notable ones include the constant sound effect that plays with the everlasting light weather. It's quite subtle but if you have a good ear for it you will pick up on it and it adds to the oppressive nature of the ever encroaching light. And what's awesome is that even if you don't notice it, chances are your brain picked it off subconsciously and so when you restore the night sky, it kinda clicks how that eerie sound is now gone and you now have this feeling of serenity as it's no longer there. Another stellar use of sound effects is in Amarot, where you got just so many things going on at once. I can imagine that must have taken them a while to put together. The last thing I want to say before I wrap up part 1, Masayoshi Soken is a warrior of light in the truest sense of the word, he really is. Him creating to the edge while literally in the hospital fighting cancer shows just how much heart and soul the developers pour into this game and the fact that the other developers as well as the community showed so much love to him. Even the F14 charity initiative for fighting cancer, which began a year earlier, got overwhelming support the next year as fans from across the world donated to help fight cancer. You know, the fact that To The Edge was already such an incredible song in its own right, one of the best final boss teams ever created in any video game and yet, the story surrounding the creation of the song arguably takes precedence over its impact in the narrative. To me, speaks volumes behind the appreciation not just for the actual songs he composed, but for the composer, Masayoshi Soken himself. We are truly lucky to have such passionate developers creating these stories. Alright, so this is the end of part 1. If you are wondering how has this man not mentioned any characters yet, that would be because the next part is dedicated almost entirely to talking about the characters. I wanted it to be its own video because there will be a lot to talk about and as many of you may have noticed by now, I am such a huge nerd for when it comes to talking about characters in video games. It's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Anyways, now I want to know your take on what you liked about Shadowbringers. You don't need to respond in 45,000 words like I did. Simply sharing what aspects of the story you enjoyed the most is plenty enough. As always, if you enjoyed the content, subscribing is the easiest way to stick around in this channel. Alright, have a nice day and I hope to see you in the next episode.